NFA football action today, live from Franklin Field in Philadelphia. It's the 89th meeting between the Princeton Tigers and the Penn Quakers. Hi everyone, Scott Graham on hand, and this matchup is generally, well, as exciting as it is, unpredictable. Looking at two teams coming in here today, both with something to prove, at least one, the Penn Quakers, still with a shot as far as the Ivy League is concerned. I'm joined now by my partner and color commentator today, Bob Cassiola, the former Princeton coach. And Bob, when you start taking a look at Penn right now, realize they still got a shot at things. Princeton basically has to think about the role of the spoiler. The role of the spoiler for Princeton, and also if they've got any pride, which they do, they're looking to at least have a winning season and this game will be pivotal for that. But Penn has a shot at it all, and they realize it right now. It should be a great game. When you look at the Penn Quakers and the effect that they have had over the years, most of it has come with having one dominant running back. Now, early in the season, that's not something that Penn had. But over the last three weeks, they have found it and are riding the momentum behind Jim Finn. Jim Finn, a great athlete. When you consider one of the few players uh, in the history of football, recently at least, to, to play both ways, now turning out to be the running back for him. As we see him here, going in for a score against Brown. He's big, he's strong, he's not fancy, but he's very, very durable. On the other side of the ball for Penn, the guy who can dominate the game entirely in large stretches if he's healthy is Mitch Merrill. 97. Watch him here chase down the Brown quarterback. I fully believe that Mitch Merrill is the best defensive football player in the Ivy League probably in the last 10 years. He's tremendous. He can dominate the game from the defensive line position. Now, Princeton, of course, this season has suffered through, well, a couple of setbacks. Still, they come in with a better than 500 record. And one of the things that their team has always been predicated on has been the ability to come in here and beat Penn. More on that in a bit. They start things out on the defensive side with a guy in the middle, an all-Ivy linebacker named Tim Green. Excellent linebacker, very active. Not that big, but you'll see him here blitzing against Fordham earlier in the year. He gets through clean. He makes the tackle. He'll make tackles on both sides of the line of scrimmage. He is the leader of their defense. Now, the quarterback situation for Princeton is interesting. The guy who is back after leading the Ivy League in passing efficiency in 95 is Harry McKelney. McKelney was an outstanding player for him as a sophomore, as a junior, as you know, took a year off last year. Came back with uh, great hopes for this season, but it's been disappointing for McKelney and for Princeton's offense. He's had tough days, particularly when the weather is wet. Well, waiting in the wings today, if it is necessary, is the backup quarterback who came out of relief last week, John Burnham. Burnham is a young player. He only got a few snaps last week, but uh, he's there. And I think if anything happens today that doesn't go well for Princeton's offense, we're going to see a lot of Jackie Burnham. Princeton has had an awful lot of success against Penn, and the team that's won this game has had a lot of success. In four of the last five years, the winner of this game has gone on to win the Ivy title. It's a longtime rivalry, a bitter rivalry, and a friendly rivalry. We'll be back with a look at the lineups in the opening kickoff. It is Princeton visiting Penn next. It's amazing what some guys go through just to get an authentic NFL jersey. They should just watch the NFL team shop on QVC. Authentic NFL merchandise delivered right to your door. Pretty painless, really. But some guys never learn. Welcome back to Franklin Field here in Philadelphia. Princeton and Penn today as the Quakers try to stay alive in the Ivy League race and Princeton tries to spoil the party as best they can. There's a look at the weather conditions and right now we're seeing just a little bit of drizzle. Temperature around 50, but with the wind gust to 25 miles an hour coming across the field, it feels a lot cooler than that. Al Bagnoli, the head coach of the Quakers, he saw his team win the coin toss and elect to defer until the second half. There's Steve Tashis, the 11th year head coach of the Princeton Tigers, and we'll have more on those men during the course of the day. For Penn, Jason Feinberg has it teed up and ready to go. The extreme deep back for Princeton is Jerry Giorato. He's the guy they'd like to handle the kickoff if it's possible. However, that's not going to be the case. It'll be taken down at the six-yard line. And straight up across the 25 to the 30, the guy who's going to get a little bit of time today is the freshman, Kyle Grant. He stepped in as a backup running back and will see some time before the day is through. Now, Harry McKelley is the starting quarterback for this Princeton team. The numbers on the season, just 41% of the completion ratio. And last week, 5 for 21 for 9 yards. He wants to come out and try to establish the throwing game as quickly as is possible today and try to get some of his momentum back. First down to 10, Princeton to their own 31 yard line. There is Girado. He got it 
out across the 33-yard line for a pickup of a couple on first down. Now, Gerardo is one guy to keep an eye on in the backfield. He's a sophomore. He's a workhorse back, along with Mike Clifford in the backfield. They go with Phil Wendler and Ryan Crowley as the wide receivers. Jason Glotchback is the tight end. The Princeton offensive line has gone through just the one change this week. Brian Wilson steps in for Bernie Marsick in the starting center spot. Second down and eight. but can't get entirely beyond it, and John Bishop came up to make the hit for a loss of a yard of the play back inside 32. Penn defense can swarm, and, well, during the course of the last couple of weeks, they have been terrific. Zinsu, Rasko, Puzio, Marrow, and Roger Beckwith up front. That means they go with a couple of linebackers, and Tim Gage and Darren McDonald. And the defensive backfield is a veteran group. Piela and Robertson are the corners. Bishop and Ferguson are the safeties. Big third down play coming up now for Princeton. They've got three wide receivers in the game. Then coming with a four-man rush. Marrow coming through to the inside, but now McKelvey throws complete. And first down yardage. Out near the 44-yard line. Catch was made by Wendler up the left side. They went into the shotgun, which they like to do with McKelvey. The question is, can he deliver the football? That time he hit the second tier. The middle receiver in the in the pattern, and when we've got the first down for him. Very important early on here for Princeton to have some success offensively. As you see, Nikelly looking left all the way, and just Wendler kind of backed up Robertson and then curled back to the ball. So on first down, Gerardo nailed by Tim Gage. Penetration into the backfield for a three-yard loss. Having trouble all season, Princeton running the football. Steve Tasha says we just want to nickel, nickel and dime people once in a while, keep them honest with the run. But when you come up and you run that first down play and come up with that kind of a play, you're in trouble. They're forced now into a passing situation. And probably a couple of passing situations. Nothing home, and the linebacker coming in shooting the gap was Tim Gage. Princeton team does rush for a little bit more than 100 yards a game and throws for about 141. They have struggled offensively, putting up just 16 points a game. On second down. Piella got there, so did Doug Zinser, and more loss of yardage on the play, back to the 38-yard line. Here comes Piella from the cornerback position to make the play at the line of scrimmage. So you, you know what Penn's thinking is. They're going to put pressure right away on the run, figuring they can't move the football, or if it turns out to be a pass, they're going to have that extra rusher. Here you see it from ground level. They're running a little counter play. Gerardo as he comes up, but look at the blue shirts around that uh, running back, and again, third and long for Harry McKelney. Not the situation he wants to be in at all. One for one of the third down conversions today, 32% for the year. Kelly once again out of the gun, with an inside screen. It's not going to go to Rob, however. Chris Parsons coming up with a big tackle on Ryan Crowley. And Pitts is going to have to punt. What a great play by Parsons. He came across from the right cornerback position, the extra back in there, and made the hit on the line of scrimmage for a short, actually for a short game. Big play by the Penn defense. And now they get the football. Hard time for Princeton. Biello back deep to take it. And he is a very, very dangerous return man. Not a good kick. But it takes a great Princeton roll inside the 15-yard line. Rolling on down. And they're just going to let this baby roll to a stop inside the 3-yard line. So not a great kick. Turns out to be a very productive kick for the Princeton special teams as they've got Penn pinned down for their first possession. Scott, we got some wind here today, and I think the wind played a factor. It sort of took the ball away from Piala's any chance of him coming up the field, and so he had to let it hit the ground, and it just got a good bounce for him. There's Matt Rader, the starting quarterback for the Quakers. A 12 of 19 week for just over 100 yards last week. Didn't have to be that effective with the way the running game has been played. Jason McGee is in as the deep back of the I formation now on first down. And with a man in motion, it's going to be McGee. I think he's way across the right side and out to the six yard line for a two yard pickup on first down. Now he is the starting running back. He's not the guy we're probably going to see the most of today. But McGee did get the start here today, along with Brian Cosmello, the U back. The wide receivers are O'Neill and James. And Steve Gross is the tight end. Levin, Cooney, Soyster, Konish, and Riley making up the Penn offensive front. Four of those five players are seniors. 
Smith is now checked into the game at the tailback position on second down. Once again, Jim Finn following the lead, trying to get around the outside. Nice play made by David Ferrara to make sure that he didn't get to turn the corner. And Finn got shoved out of bounds. A third down now coming up for the Quakers. Quincy plays defensively out of a 4-3 set. King, Welling, Ferrara, and Tucker are the men up front. A very active linebacking crew. They've got three of them and three good ones. And Jamie Toddings, Jim Saunders, and Tim Green. And the defensive backs can make things happen as well. Damani Leach and Jerry Wilson are the quarters. Ludwig and Gettler are the safeties. Third down situation now for Raider and the Quakers. Got to get out to the 15-yard line for the first. Head drop, and his throw is incomplete. Tim Green came awfully close to coming up with an interception as they were trying to find David Rogers in a quick slam. Exactly. That was the pattern. He looked for him. He was there. Big play by 44. He's making plays throughout his career, particularly this year. Tim Green, the senior out of Cartersville, Georgia. Got his hands on that one. 107 tackles for Green last year. Came into the game today with 65 of them on this season. Breakers pushed way back now, and Princeton looks as though they may be thinking in terms of trying to come up with a block here. No, no, maybe not. They may be setting up the return. They're going to have a good field position as Salvino is back way up halfway through his end zone. They're coming after him. Salvino got decked. Ball takes a hit and kind of bites like a sand wedge. Flat down on the play. Back in the end zone as Salvino did get hit. And the ball rolls to his stop at the Penn 43-yard line. But with Salvino getting hit, this is probably going to be a penalty against Princeton. And if it is only, oh, it is the personal foul. The personal foul means that Penn's going to get a first out. That's it, right. They decided to come with 10, put the pressure on him. They put the pressure on him, but unfortunately, got the personal foul is going to give them a, a big pen an opportunity now to get a first down and get much better field position than when they started. As you know, there are two penalties for banging into the kicker. There's running into and roughing. This one appears to be roughing. Fifteen yards, first down. Referee Dennis Hennigan making the call, and here's a look at it. Well, you see from the left side, they're coming in, they're putting a lot of pressure, and actually, Ooh. his own guy took him out. His own guy took him out, right. But that doesn't matter. That's the same penalty, because you're pushing the, the blocker into him, it's the same penalty. Well, big break for the Quakers now, as they get moved out to their 23-yard line, and their first drive gets a chance to continue on the penalty. Rossignol going in motion for the Quakers, that means Finn is the lone setback. And a reverse. Rossignol got a block, and now has a lead in front of him. It's Raider, the quarterback, and Rossignol dives across the 30-yard line out to the 32. But how about the block in the nine-yard game from the quarterback, Matt Raider? Good play. Had great field position, spread the field with the receivers. They just got the ball back to the right guy. Rossignol got on the corner, made some good yardage before he was taken down by Damani Leach from the cornerback position. Here we see it now, a little toss back, hand back by Finn, and here comes Rossignol behind the block. Now let's pick up with the quarterback, number 12 Raider, and you'll see, uh, was just sort of there, he is. there he is right there. He's, <laughs> he made enough of a block to pick up a couple more extra yards. Second down at short, and Finn cutting back finds room to the 35 yard line. That'll move the chains, and Penn's got a first down. Finn is not fancy. He's big, he's strong, he's very athletic, and that's what he does best. Cutting back, running up inside behind those blockers and getting that extra yardage. Well, that's what he's done with great frequency over the last three weeks, averaging more than six yards a carry. And eight touchdowns. He has been terrific. Raider once again setting him up now. The 36-yard line, it's first down and 10. Drop and another quick throw that's going to be complete. Dominic McNeil, his third reception of the season, as he gets it out to the 42 yard line. You've got to be impressed with the arm on Raider. He's got he throws a real tight spiral, but more importantly, he's very strong and he delivers the ball from sideline to sideline. That time we see him here, short drop back, quick delivery here. The ball's right on the money, and that keeps your defense uneasy. You get that first down play, you come up when it's a running situation, you'll be able to throw the ball, pick up yardage, everything gets on schedule. Second down now with a band in motion. That's Carson. Once again, it is Finn, but this time great play by Toddings to get into the backfield and throw him for a two-yard loss back to the 40-yard line. Jamie Toddings, the senior out of Barnegat. 
Toddings was just coming down. They had a stun on. He was coming back to the inside, and they called a run play. A little counteraction, and he got, as you see him, he'll come from the right side of the screen here. There's Finn going back inside. There's Toddings crashing down inside, beats the block of the fullback. Number 34, Rosignol, and uh, no game. So now a third down situation. Possibly a passing situation. You would assume out of the gun, that's where they're going. Later, got hit as he threw it. It's going to get picked. First interception of the season for Tim Green on the batted ball. Actually, Raider just got clocked as he got rid of it, and I believe it was Ferrara who made the hit, but Princeton comes up with a big turnover and will take over with their own 46. Ferrara, the sophomore out of Ramsey, very active player to play a big down lineman, a tackle, end of the defensive end. He, gets, he beats the block of the offensive lineman, gets enough on Raider to force that kind of a throw and the interception for Princeton. Here we see it again. There's Ferrara's second effort. He really clocks him. And Tim Green was in position, nice athletic play, getting it in with one hand. As we said, his first pick off of the year, Al Bagnoli's squad is giving it right back now as Princeton's got their field position. First and 10 for their own 46. Well, for Kelly. Locks it all, going way up top, and it's incomplete. And that ball been taken in by Crowley. He could have gone for the score as he got by Bishop. The two kind of collided down near the 20 yard line, and as Bishop went down, and Crowley held on, he could have danced into the end zone. That was a little counteraction play. Here we see uh, McKinley come out, take to the right side, comes back off boot. He's looking for him right in the middle on the post. He throws the ball to the other side, and he has to come back for the football. He has a chance for it, but he doesn't hold on. There's the contact, as we said, down near the 20 yard line, and as Bishop hit it, the ball did get on the hand of Ryan Crowley, but he couldn't hang on. Three receivers, Vincent on second down. And Kelly with a target. That's first down yardage as he got to the 43 yard line. Canole was the intended receiver. And he comes down with the catch for the Princeton Bears down. Canole comes into the game as the leading receiver with 22 receptions coming into the Penn game. That time, the Kelly showed what he can do. He put the ball right where he had to. Canole came back for it, caught the ball, got enough for the first down. There's the delivery. There's Canole making the catch. The Kelly looks great in practice, and that's why they're hanging with him. He's just had a tough day on Saturday, particularly the last two Saturdays. In through the middle, and now they've set up the run a little bit with a couple of passes as Gerardo gets inside the 40-yard line for a three-yard pickup. Again, just trying to find their way in, get some yardage on that first down play. Gerardo. Comes into this football game with, uh, with a, a lot of carries, 115 carries, but he's only 5'10, 170 pounds. And they've got to pick and choose the spots for him. Steve Tashus in his 11th season, three Ivy titles in the last seven years, and in 1989, he was the Division I AA Coach of the Year. On second down. Oh, slide step. He's running out toward the flat. Crosses the fumble, and the Quakers come up with the loose ball as Piello pounces on top of it. We said earlier, Mitch Morrow can dominate a game. Not just a position, a game. He showed it there. He just beat the block. Watch the, the, right, the left side of the screen. He comes up the field. He goes through two blockers, knifes down, adjusts, and look at the hit he puts on McKelney, and it was a fumble. He never had a chance to... To, to move that arm forward. Again, you'll see 97 inside, goes through the tackle, beats the guard inside, and makes the play on the quarterback. Fumble picked up by Piello, who's coming out of corner blitz, and now the Quakers are in Princeton territory. First and 10 for 43. Finn following the lead, broke the tackle, and got it inside the 40 yard line. Well, you see the strength of Finn as a running back, getting on the corner. Open field tackle, just breaks it down and gets on and makes yardage out of the play. Great position here for Pennsylvania. We've got the ball in great field position. Al Bagnoli, 16th season overall. His sixth year in which he is 42 and 13. That's Rossigo going to the top of your screen, splitting out on second down. Drop once again, quick throw, but maybe a little bit too much on it. As Raider gunned it over to Washington, and it went right through his hands. One, one back deep, three wide receivers. Washington, the fullback on the left side, just coming down on a little stop pattern, and the ball really just thrown that well. I think it was a tough ball from the hand. So now at a third down play, 
Quakers look like they're in a throwing situation. Once again, it's going to be third down at six. Two receivers to select. Once again, out of that left side high formation, the blitz is coming. It's picked up. Now Finn, they're going to try to let him create out there. down to the 28, an 11-yard pickup. And what you want to do these days is go with the hot hand. Finn has it. He had to beat a tackle from Brett Marshall, and as soon as he did that, he had the first down. With a swing pattern here. Watch seven come out on the right side, and uh, Rader just dumps it off to him. Now it's a one-on-one -on -one situation in the open field, and he takes the defender and fakes him out, cuts back inside. Extra good. That's why he's playing offense today. He's come a long way this season. That's why he's left defense behind entirely and appear for the rest of the year. First down now, Pat for 28. Finn's in a lot of trouble back there. Tries to get back through again. Green throw him down for a two-yard loss. A lot of pursuit coming from Wheeling and Griffin that forced him to turn it back inside. And it's Green that finally took him down. Penn trying to run back into the sideline with the tailback. It's just a power play. Now he realizes they've slanted that way. He tries to get his balance. Does well to get back to just a two-yard loss. And now it looks as though a timeout is being called, an official timeout, as they try to set the ball and figure out where it's supposed to be. It'll be a second down and 11 situation now for the Quakers. Once again, it has been the deep back, and now Raider is checking off. Across his body, got a man, incomplete. Leaping attempt made by O'Neill the end zone a couple of weeks ago. We saw him make several spectacular catches against Brown, but that time he couldn't quite hold it in. This was an adjustment of part of Raider. He, he pulled out of this, came up with, from the pressure, saw this man open running the post pattern. Good coverage there by Damani Leach, the senior cornerback for Princeton. He's right with the defender. So now third down is Raider gambled and went up top. Out of the shotgun. All kinds of time. James makes the catch, but Green makes the hit. Down at the 27-yard line. And now they're going to try with Jeremiah Greathouse. He's going to have a long field goal attempt of about 44 yards here with a heavy crosswind coming from his left to his right. And he's set up on the right hash mark, so he's going to have to kick it heavily to the left. Great house, out of season, 6 out of 13 on the field goal tries. Cloud is the holder. He got it well, and that kick is good. Jeremiah Greathouse nails it from 34 yards away, and Penn capitalizes on the turnover. They are on the board with a 3 to nothing lead. We have seen that so many times from Greathouse. He has been incredibly consistent. Actually, both teams had a great kicking game, and that could be the difference today. Now, Greathouse is a guy who potentially can get it done. This time he did from 44 yards away. Even with the heavy crosswind, Lakers down by that 3 to nothing score. 429, as you can see, left here in the first quarter. What we've seen in, a, in, the, in this part of the first quarter is two teams with very strong defense, and both of them are playing very tough, creating turnovers. Princeton hanging tough in there, forcing Penn to go to the field goal, which they did. But the Penn defense and the play of particularly Mitch Marrow will be the key today. If he can play a lot more than he's played in the past because of injuries and sickness, I think he'll be the big factor. We saw it in that key play on the Kelney the last time Princeton had the football. The defenses of both teams look very sharp. Just a 16-yard drive. That was all that was necessary. Now Gerardo comes back deep to take the kickoff. As Jason Feinberg will tee it up back at his own 35-yard line, Pennsylvania. Last year was a tight defensive battle between these two teams. A 10-6 pin. Long pack fielded by Brandt down at his goal line. And he's going to have to come back across the field. Runs into interference and gets dropped at the 20-yard line. Jeremiah Greathouse has put Penn up by a 3-0 score and now can watch again as the defense tries to hold. Take a look at the officials for today's game. Dennis Hennigan, the referee. James Dinkle, the umpire. The headlinesman is Milt Halstead. The line judge, James Mello. The back judge, Paul Barringer. Field judge is Richard Sawchuk. And the side judge is Dennis Blythe. 
First and 10 now for Princeton at their own 20. And they're going to try to run the ball again. Nothing there. Maybe a pickup of about a half a yard for Bruce Herb. The fullback who was charged with running that football tried to get it into the line and Penn just swarming through the middle of the field. Penn very tough defensively. Aside from Mitch Merrill, uh, Larry Roscoe has had an outstanding season in defensive tackle, and that time he was in position to help in that play. Princeton's running game, we mentioned it earlier, has really been inconsistent, and uh, this has been one of their big problems offensively, forcing them to go to the pass. Kyle Grant, the freshman, is the deep back now in that offset. I on second down. Last play action. The Kelly's looking one way alone, and there it is, complete. Out to the 24 yard line, Glotzbach brought it in and got hurt and out of bounds by the Pennsylvania defense after a game that took him out to the 24. Nice delivery that time. The county coming out, sprinting out to his left side here, gets his shoulders around with enough to deliver the football to his tight end who just comes off the line. There's 89, makes the catch here in the flat. Darren McDonald stepped up to make the hit. The tight end stayed in and then released at the last moment. Very conservative, controlled pass, but enough to put him now in a situation where they're within striking distance. A third down and six. McKelly again will use the gun. Big safety blitz down and throw to the big hit area for the first down. Great hit made by McDonald, but not before Wendler came across the 31-yard line for the first. And that time, McKelvey saw the safety blitz and threw right to the area that Bishop had vacated. Exactly. He read the blitz, and he has the ability to do that. He has the experience. And he delivered the football on the crossing pattern there. There's the receiver, Wendler, coming across, and he just gets across the line to get enough for the first down. A big hit from Piella coming up from the side of his corner position. There it is there. And we see Piella, excuse me, 44 coming up. McDonald, a linebacker to make the hit. Let's see how we can get him. First and ten for the 32-yard line. Option play, and Kelly's going to keep it. And he's got good room as Hiskin made the hit out across the 36-yard line after a pickup of four. Little option now with McKelly that time. He made the right choice. Penn had it defended on the pitch. He kept the ball back inside and picked up good yardage. Well, that's an aspect of his game that we haven't talked much about, but Kelly does have enough mobility to be able to throw a little bit of running into it as well. Well, he stands 6'2", 205 pounds, got enough size to run the ball occasionally. There's the Ivy League titles for Steve Toshis. And right now you see that he's calling for a timeout as he doesn't like the way the offense is set up with 225 left here in the first quarter. It's going to be a struggle for his team today to continue to put it together offensively, one drive after the other. But right now they begin a drive, shredding it by three. We'll be right back. This telecast of Princeton University football is sponsored in part by McCaffrey Supermarkets. McCaffrey's, there is a difference. McCaffrey Supermarkets are committed to maintaining the highest standards in fresh meats and poultry. McCaffrey's uses only USDA inspected prime and choice meats, as well as certified Angus beef in all their stores. McCaffrey's, a supermarket experience in Princeton, West Windsor, and Yardley, Pennsylvania. Every few years, a family show comes along that captures America's heart. Add Comedy Central's new show, South Park, to that list. It'll make you laugh. Laugh all you want. I'm the one who's gonna be on TV, looking all buff. It'll make you cry. Do your impersonation of David Caruso's career! It'll make you puke. <laughs> Kids say the darndest things. Watch South Park, only at Comedy Central. out here going to be on all day the situation is dark it's a little on the chill side but fortunately we haven't had much in the way of rain yet good crowd on hand for homecoming saturday here at franklin field 225 left in the first and a second and five for the tigers an explosion run out to the 45 yard line and a pick up a Seven yards for freshman Kyle Brandt seeing his first action today. Kyle Brandt was a highly recruited high school player out of the Chicago area. Princeton was fortunate to get him, and Steve Taji said this week, because of the injury to Damian Taylor, we've got to play this kid and see what he can do. Looked pretty good in that first play. 
They got a lot of room opening up for him. And as we said, the team basically went through the first six games without any injury problems at all. They've lost several key players over the last couple of weeks. Once again, Grant hits hold and gets it to the 49 yard line for a four yard pickup. Notice the fact that Mitch Morrow is not, oh, he's just getting back in the game defensively. The first play they ran was over the position of Morrow. He was not in the game. They ran over Jason Mayer, uh, number 69, who subs for him, and they made good yardage. Back in the game now is Morrow. They're giving him a little bit of time because he needs it. He's about 80% uh, to where he should be. There he is. Suffering through a concussion this year and then about with mononucleosis. And he's a guy that a lot of people expected would get NFL draft notices. We'll see what happens over these last couple of weeks. On second down, again, Grant going to run. Again, going to run for this down yardage. Leapfrogging his way down to the 44-yard line. And the freshman has come in and provided some instant spark for the Princeton offense. Good quickness, a little toss back to Brandt. Ran over the right side over right tackle Steve Lamberton for some good yardage. There you see him now cutting up back into the hole. He does have quickness, and he's got size. On the line, meanwhile, take a look at Mitch Merrill just getting taken out by Justin Bennett, and never a factor in the play as Bennett made a dive to block it out. Once again, Grant hitting the hole. This time he's going to get it down inside the 42-yard line for a pickup of a couple of yards. As we're down to 45 seconds left here in the first quarter, and Princeton's on the move. Marrow six foot, excuse me, Grant is six foot, 200 pounds at running back. Comes out of Stevenson High School, the suburbs of Chicago. We saw Steve Tasha sending in the play. Began his Princeton career as the offensive coordinator before taking over as a head coach. On second down now, McKelney has three wide receivers to choose from. Sprint out left to try to buy some time, and the throw is knocked down. Bishop knocked it out of the air after Robinson got a hand in on it. It fell toward the ground, and Bishop picked it off. The second turnover of the game for Princeton, and Penn's got it back. The guy who made the play, as you called it, was Robertson. The cornerback comes up. Watch number 24 come up and make the hit right there. Great defensive, defensive play. Goes right in the hands of number 22, Bishop. Bishop, by the way, has played very consistently from the uh, strong safety position. Another interception, another turnover. Big play for Bishop. His third interception of the year is Penn the ball back. We've seen three turnovers here in the first quarter alone. Eight seconds left in the first as Penn takes it back again. A little play action. Penn has got all day to throw and he throws and it is incomplete. Princeton Bench thought they might have had a chance for a pickoff there as John James was locked up with Damani Leach. Both went after it along the ground. Great reaction here. This is a bootleg play by the quarterback Grader. As he comes out of the boot, he throws the ball. He's looking for Jones. James, his favorite receiver. And you see it all. It's a good call by the official. It did hit the ground. But two outstanding athletes going for the football, Leach and James. Ben Quaker helping to rile the crowd. I don't know where his hat is. Second attempt from the 35. Last play of the first quarter is McGee. Covers the football. It's on the ground. Tim Green's got it. Pinched and recovers. The last play of the first quarter, Tim Green recovers the fumble from Jason McGee. And we have seen four turnovers in the first quarter. But more importantly now, the Princeton fans get to see their team get it back in Penn territory. Green coming up a loose ball on the final play of the first quarter. Time out on the field, one down and three to go. They're going to try to clean up the level of the game with four turnovers in the first period. Three nothing, Penn. We'll be right back. The best cable channels can only be found in RCN's family value package. RCN's Family Value Package is the complete cable package. Call 1-800-321-544. They are the faces of today, the faces of yesterday. They've shaped our world, captured our hearts. 
Extraordinary people, extraordinary lives, five nights a week on Biography. Big turnover for Penn at the end of the first quarter, Bob. Here comes McGee. He's trying to run a power play. Knifing in there from the outside position is number 35. That's Toddings. He really makes the fumble. He hits McGee, who eventually was carried off the field during the break between quarters. There you see the fumble, and there number 44 finds the football as he's found many tackles this year. The leader of this defense, Timmy Green. Turnover is two for either side. Tim Green has both of them, but pick off in a fumble recovery. That young lady is auditioning for a future spot, I would imagine. Meantime, the Princeton band decked out in their traditional bar. All part of this rivalry that's been going on for an awful long time. First and ten. Toronto held up in the backfield. It was McDonald that ultimately made the tackle. But I believe it was Roscoe who got in there first to slow up his progress for a loss of the play. Larry Roscoe, the junior out of the Bronx, New York, the defensive left tackle came in, got penetration. Gerardo never had a chance to make the cut. McDonald right in the middle of that defensive core. This is a veteran group, and they've gotten better and better as the season has gone on. Time this time, way up to the top, he over through the receiver. Phil Wendler was streaking by himself down the left sideline, and the ball was overthrown. Let's take it down to the field right now and check in with Jason Bard. All right, thanks very much, guys. Uh, not play that Jason McGee fumbled. He apparently injured himself right now. They are working on his knee, as you can see right behind me. Also, one other note, you've been talking about Mitch Marrow and his coming in and out of the game. Well, when he does come to the bench, he's really gasping for air on the sidelines. This week, Coach Al Bagnoli said he's not quite 100%, and what's lacking right now is his endurance. He played 20 plays three weeks ago, 40 the week after that. Last week, 60. They're trying to get him back up to 100%. Let's go back up to Scott and Bob. Thanks, Jason. Screen pass with the throw over the top. It eludes Mike Clifford. Once again, Mitch Marrow just came in and made Harry Nakelny's life miserable. And more importantly, it's now going to set up a punt. But poor execution by Nakelny. He had the screen set up. He just delivered the ball too high to get anything out of it. Here comes Princeton with a break. Gets good field position on the fumble. Three downs, and they got to punt the football. This is tough. This is what their offense has been through most of this season. Josh is only talking it over on the sideline as Matt Evans has now come on. He's hit nine balls this year inside the 20. That's what he's going for right now. Little pooch kick, but a lot on it. And that one's going to go blasting through into the end zone as Piella let it go. And a touchback. The Quakers are going to get it back first and 10 at their own 20-yard line. Just about a minute into the second quarter. Pens try to stay alive for the Ivy League title when they're up by three. It's amazing what some guys go through just to get an authentic NFL jersey. They should just watch the NFL team shop on QVC. Authentic NFL merchandise delivered right to your door. Pretty painless, really. But some guys never learn. If you smoke pot one time, it probably won't kill you. But if you keep smoking it, you might just get dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber and Dama! Did you know that eating hot dogs can make a kid 46% less likely to use drugs? Be a mentor. Make a difference. Second quarter action here at Franklin Field in Philadelphia and Penn with a 3-0 lead over Princeton. What we've seen so far is a turnover play game. Al Bagnoli, the best career, career winning percentage among active coaches in America, won 80% of his games. 
Hosting 10 Quakers at their own 20 yard line coming off a close to the Long count of the game. Big blitz coming. It's picked up. Raiders got plenty of time. A one on the center. First down yardage or more. 30 yards plus on the play as they found Dave Rogers, a freshman, on a 35 yard gain at the left sideline. Great protection for Raider. Plenty of time to find Rogers to get open here on the sideline. Rogers came across, found the sideline here. There he is, wide open. Missed something bad about the Princeton coverage here. They, they really messed it up, and he was wide open. And Raider, with a good sense of the field, found him and got great field position, turned this thing around. Here we see the play on the sideline, and Rogers avoids the tackle and picks up another five yards. Rogers among the youngster receivers who's really stepped up this year in the second half of the season. Now they're in Princeton territory. On first down, the throw is to Carson, and he's beginning to specialize in that route. Getting inside and dropping down after a five-yard pickup inside the 40-yard line. That's a good call. First down, safe pass with a slant pattern on the first down play. Just get five, six yards. Raider puts the ball right out there. Defender comes up. You look up, and it's second down and five. Jerry Wilson stepping in a bit late, and that's been the bread and butter of this pan aerial attack this year. Is a quick look in to a wide receiver on a very quick drop in the quarterback. Finn. Taken down by Welling. Down at the 37-yard line, maybe a little bit inside. Third down and short coming up now for Penn. Matt Raider coming out of Pensbury High School in Pennsylvania. 4-0 student out of high school, outstanding scholar athlete, honored by the National Football Foundation. He was one of the top senior high school players in the country, went on to Duke where he transferred last year. Got a lot of confidence, a lot of poise. He's been under the gun, as we know, before. Third down situation. Ball a long yard. Finn calls it a first down, I believe. Now, Tottings was riding him from the back to try to knock him down, and it all depends on the spot of the football, but I believe he's got first down yardage, Buff. You got it. Good job on the left side by LeBron and Cooney. Blocking up front at the guard and tackle positions for Penn. Here you see him just going, following that wall of blockers to get the first down. He's a strong runner. Oh, look at that. Ball is loose and picked up by Penn. And guess what? They marked it to where the ball was picked up. So it was a fumble on the play, and they... He was going to be right at the yard marker, which was at about the 34-yard line, but fumbled it forward for another yard, and now they've marked it at the 33. And now Raider is calling for a timeout as the Quakers try to set it offensively, trying to avoid any miscues now that they've got the ball inside the Princeton 35-yard line. Light mist has begun to fall, but that's not bothering anybody around here. Penn fans coming out today to try to see a win. Every day, a and &E takes you where no other network can. It's daytime's best suspense in Mystery Theater. It's primetime excitement featuring biographies, mysteries, and specials. And weekends, a and &E delivers quality shows, hilarious comedies. For viewers, it's time well spent. For advertisers, it's money well invested. Call your local cable advertising representative to target your message to the right a and &E audience. The best cable channels can only be found in RCN's Family Value Package. RCN's Family Value Package is the complete cable package. Call 1-800-321-0544. Second quarter action with Penn leading it by a 3-0 score. And Matt Rader has come out after being hit as he threw and throwing an interception early in the game. Beginning to find his stride a little bit as he's got his team on the move down to the Princeton 33-yard line. Play action. Looking deep down the field. Rader up top. Got the man. It's down to the three, Ben Zagorski, his second catch of the year, the first one, 
was a 38-yarder. That one got him down all the way to the two-yard line. Now they're mixing their plays beautifully, throwing on the early down situation. This is a strong play. He gives a strong bootleg fake as he comes out. And Raider sets up going to his left, waits for Zagorski to come open, and he is open, beautifully thrown, big gain. Penn in excellent position to get another score here. First and goal at the two-yard line. Finn has been a bird dog for the end zone. It is Finn pushing his way down to the goal line, but didn't quite get in. It'll be second down and goal coming up. Got to be impressed with Matt Rader. He's really come into his own here, and you see the confidence level. Gives the ball to his best back right there, the big back behind the right side of the line of scrimmage, running up behind Chris Riley, the right tackle. And, he's, and here it is again. There's the, the bootleg pass, finding his receiver number 82 deep in Princeton territory, and it's hard to find that guy. Those are crossing receivers. People get locked up in the run play, and they get behind the defenders. Second and goal, it's Finn again, diving for it, but didn't get there. Once again, good push by the Princeton defensive line down low, and because Finn decided not to leave his feet and dive for the end zone, he really had nowhere to go once he got to the line of scrimmage and got stopped short. Very good on that left side. Tough play, too, by Jamie Tidings, number 35, the uh, outside linebacker to that side. And number 50 for Princeton came in. Chuck Hastings from the other linebacker position to make the hit. So now third down. Princeton is held twice. Then trying to slam it through. Then again, diving. And he didn't make it. And he did. Touchdown. Late call from the official. The initial call was marking the football, and the arms went up. And a relieved Al Bagnoli has watched his team bang it in from the half-yard line to take a 9-0 lead. Very important touchdown here early in the second quarter. Penn has the, up, has the possibility of going up 10-0. And they took it all the way from the 20-yard line. 80-yard drive for Penn, so uh, great execution. Matt Rader, very key in that offense. Two huge, plays beautifully. two huge 30 plus yard pass plays set it up and great house adds the point to make it a 10-0 game it was a 35 yard pass play early in the drive to dave rogers and then a 33 yard pass play make that 31 yard pass play to zagorski that set him up inside the three yard line ultimately for the touchdown and now the 10-0 lead Here's Finn vaulting the line, getting up, trying to cross the plane. And he was pushed back, but undoubtedly the side official saw him cross that plane. He got the score. Princeton, very tough defense. You look at it from ground level. Let's see where, where he does line up. There's the hand back to him. He starts at about the three-yard line to get up. Just about right there. There, as he extended, is when he got the football over the line. The official from the far side of the field did not make the call because he was screened, but it came from the near side. As the line judge, James Mello, called a touchdown. And Penn is now taking the 10 to nothing lead. This has not been an easy task for Princeton to come back. Now down 10 nothing because of their offense. They're inconsistent in their offense. The pressure's going to be on them right now, trying to get back in this ball game early. Wind blew the football off the tee, so they'll have to tee it up again. With that crosswind, it's surprising that it didn't happen on either of the first two kickoffs for Jason Feinberg. Here we go again. Wins to try to come back. And that's going to be Canal. And across the 30-yard line, out here to 31. It's again not bad position for Princeton. Another chapter of this great rivalry, and that's one of the things that we're going to be examining coming up today at halftime. A look back at some of the great players, some of the great moments, and some of the more memorable plays of the Penn-Princeton rivalry, all coming up at halftime. You were part of this rivalry a little bit, Bob. Yes, sir. Player, coach, assistant coach, head coach, know it well. Great place to play here. Yeah, great history to it, too. This run on the drive, belongs to Brad as he gets it out across the 33-yard line. Maybe a pickup of about two yards, second down coming up. 
I mean, we have seen so, so many wildly unpredictable games as you take a look at the Penn scoring drive. But in the history of this rivalry, there have been big leads, big comebacks, bizarre plays that nobody will ever forget. Almost always a lot of fun. Second down now for Nicole and the Tigers. Gerardo in motion. Big blitz. Kelly back of the three, three yard line. Patrick Beckwith came like a train from the right defensive side, and nobody touched him. Number 40 comes in there clean. He comes a little late, and he waits for the blocking to, to get set up, and then watch from the left side. There he comes clean. The Kelly never has a chance to set up or get rid of the football, and now the Princeton offense is starting to take its licks, and you're pushing him back. You're going to force him to throw the ball here. Most likely come out the shotgun if that if in fact they're going to throw the football. Then defensive linemen, they have five of them, will normally drop one in the coverage. You get the impression they thought Beckwith was going to be dropping in the coverage and they let him go. Tough drop, oh! 17, they're going to give it a shot. They're going to keep it on the ground. Gerardo with a little bit of a move, got himself out to the 30 before Bishop floated down. And maybe back near the original line of scrimmage, but still a punting situation now on fourth down for Princeton. Steve Tosh is that time elected not to put the ball up. Try and run a little draw play here, get some yardage out of it. Good running by Gerardo, not near enough. But again, Princeton turned this thing over to Penn's offense, and they're going to bring their defense back on the field. And they played a lot of defense in this first half already. Once again, it is Matt Evans, a left footed kid. He'll let go to about his 20 yard line. Good kick. Real good kick. Way over the head of Ferguson, bouncing down inside the tent. And now the long trek upfield is only going to last about three yards as Damani Leach, playing on special teams, got down and cut him down at the 11-yard line. So Penn with a 10-0 lead, now getting the football back, not in great field position. And what they are looking for here today is a win to keep up the momentum as they try to build back to the top. Quakers in a tie for second. Now Dartmouth has already beaten them this year, but... They don't tie break in the Ivy League. All you got to do is end up with the same record, but Penn's either got to get some help or they've got to beat Harvard next week. Well, I think it, it, they, they control their own destiny. They win the next three games, and they're there because Dartmouth's starting to fade a little bit. They've lost two in a row, and I think the people have caught up with their lack of offense. So I think they're going to down to Penn and Harvard, but this game is pivotal. After a 60-yard punt, Murray's Penn back deep. They begin the process of digging out, getting it out to the... 15-yard line on the first run, along with Jim Finn for a pickup of four. Jim Finn's going to have to go the, the long way today because we know that uh, McGee was hurt uh, at the end of the first quarter, so Finn is going to the guy's going to have to carry the football and carry the load. He's big enough to do it. Uh, it wouldn't be anything new in each of the last two weeks. Princeton's opposition has had a running back set a record for number of carries in a game, and it's actually happened twice in this series in the last four years. Second out. They're going to run the reverse again. Keep an eye on Carson. And he is knocked down. Great job of staying at home for the Princeton defensive group as Griff King stayed right there on the left side and basically just waited for Carson to come back to him. There's 94 Griff King, the senior out of Potomac, Maryland. He's 6'7", 260. He does a great job. Watch this on, the, on this side. Here's the reverse coming back. And watch King 94 hold his ground here take care of his blocker, and make the hit. Great pursuit, too, from the backside by Princeton. Well played by the defense. Third down and 10 now. Get down there. Princeton would love to get a defensive stick right now and make Penn pump the end zone. Blitz quick. Throw complete. Great catch. Going to be short of the first down. I'm not sure how Dave Rogers held on to that football, but... Nonetheless, he's still going to be a yard shy of first down yardage. Two great catches for 81 Rodgers. That time the ball is thrown inside. He's being hit as he catches the football, but he holds on to it. He's a little bit short for the first down, but a big play. Young, outstanding player for Penn. Rodgers, number 19. Took some hit from Tom Ludwig, but what he did was he brought his team a little bit more room, and Salvino's got a little room now to kick it away. That is Ludwig back deep now to take the play. There's a big pen bounce at the 45 yard line and it'll roll dead at the 37. So first down and 10 for Princeton again. With 5.33 left in the half. 
These two teams have been involved specifically in the 1980s and 1990s with a lot of Ivy League titles. In fact, of all of them that have happened since 1956, there are combined 17 of them on the field today. When you look into the uh, early and mid-80s, Penn has dominated the Ivy League since with some great championship teams and undefeated championship teams. Princeton, of course, has come on strong through Steve Tosh, as they've had their share, and uh, they've, they've played real tough in the last 10 years also. It's been a great rivalry. Two teams that have come back to play a key role in Ivy League football. Next narrow, and that's really all I have to say. Guess who? Whenever you see that kind of a collision and you see it in the backfield, it's going to be Marrow. And they're picking and choosing the spots here, giving him the rest. But look at him break down the block of the offensive left tackle, Bennett, for Princeton. And he just crashes in on the count. And he's just a dominating player. Incredible. As we said, early in the season, they were talking about him as a possible second-round NFL draftee. He's missed a lot of time, but that has not diminished the talent. Under five minutes to go in the first half. And on second down, the Kelly's going to throw. Incomplete. Delivered the ball low, and Kano couldn't get his hands underneath it. And you wonder what now whether or not Princeton's offense is beginning to get a little shake. Why did he deliver the ball low? I have my philosophy is he's going to the left side. He knows that Marrow's on that side. He's going to get a rush. He's got to get rid of it quickly, and he delivered it a little bit short. Tasha's now going to send in a third down play, and once again, Princeton is looking at a third down and long situation. As a head coach, how many things you can call that are very effective on third and 15? We saw him go with the uh, draw play before, and he hasn't thrown a screen. He tried one screen incomplete. Now he's got him in the shotgun. And Kelly is working out of that shotgun, and two for five today on third down conversions. Big rush coming. Nice job by the Kelly. Avoided a great completion. He's going to be short of first down yardage to the 45-yard line as Wendler came back to the ball, and coming back, took himself out of first down yardage. He really had to come back to make the catch because Parsons, the cornerback, the fifth back in there, the nickel came up and played him real tight. So he didn't have much choice. He couldn't elude Parsons, so therefore he came up short of the first down. As you see him come back to catch the football. Good job by the county here. But good defense on the part of Parsons. So now Princeton down 10-0 to try to get something started. We'll go for it on fourth down. Just two for 15 on fourth down conversions this year. Baker's almost jumped. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to draw him off sides. He's almost got him off sides by changing the, the, the inflection of his voice. They didn't come off side. Good discipline by the Penn defense. They're going to force him to punt. They're going to take the five-yard delay penalty and then punt it away. Coach Tosh is obviously rationalizing that five yards really wasn't going to mean that much to his punter. And maybe, just maybe, you get an opportunity at the first down. But Al Bagnoli's team with a lot of discipline in staying down. Princeton and Penn uses their punting game to perfection here. Evans is an outstanding punter. Uh, Steve Tashis has a lot of confidence in his ability to perhaps put Penn back in the hole again. There's the kick. Low kick. Piano's going to have to let it bounce. And now on the move from the 21 yard line, he goes nowhere. Great defensive play on special teams for the Tigers. He's coming down. Chuck Hastings made the hit. Taking Piano's ankles with him. With 3.41 to go now, Penn comes back out with a 10-0 lead in the football. Here we see Piella. A little bit of a late hit there that wasn't called against Princeton. They better watch that. But good job covering the kick. Another good kick from Evans. Penn has the ball on the 21. First down situation now for Pennsylvania. Probably have been more effective today through the air than they have been on the ground, but the ground is where they're staying with Finn. And a flag goes down. I believe they got Cornish for holding. After a pickup of about three yards, it's coming back, and Adam Cornish, the right guard, is called for holding. You got it. Right out in the open in front of the referee. That was a stretch play that Penn likes to run. They give the ball to the tailback as he goes lateral. He looks to find a hole. That time he came up a little bit short, but uh, the penalty will push Penn back. And let's see what decision Tim Green makes here for the defense. I'm talking it over with Dennis Hennigan. And I believe they are going to take the penalty. They're going to mark it off 10 yards from the site of the infraction. Repeat first. 
Well, we told you about the fact that Penn has been a dominant team in the late 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, and early 1990s in the Ivy League. There's one team they've had an awful lot of trouble with. You know who they are. We'll talk about it after this play. Going to back them up inside the 10-yard line of a holding penalty. And now first down, a little bit more than 21 yards to go. Finn, nowhere to go with it, as it was Mark Whelan getting into the backfield to make the hit. But There's a, just about three minutes remaining in this second quarter. They may have to use some of their timeouts if they can keep Penn deep in their own territory. down, a big second and 23 now. Raider, oh, way up top, floating it out there. Incomplete. Good coverage by Leach, making sure he was step for step with McNeil down the left sideline. Just ran a fly pattern up the sideline, hoping that McNeil could break and get beyond the defender. But Leach is an experienced ball carrier and a great defender, and he was with him step by step. That stops the clock. It does Princeton a little bit of a favor with 2:46 to go. Now a third down play, and if Penn would be held short on this one, almost guaranteed, Princeton will spend the time out to make sure they've got a little time left. Breakers have brought in Alec DeFerner and David O'Neill as wide receivers now in this third down situation. Raider has a ball coming at him. Now he's going to go the other way with it, and Carson can't quite get there once again. Good coverage from Jerry Wilson, step for step on the other side. Good job. He aired the ball out. Now they've got to punt the football. He stops the clock with the incompletion, and Princeton has a chance here with 2.40. They'll probably come out with their two-minute offense and uh, try to get some points before the half. It's important they come get something here. Defensively, they've played extremely well. Offensively, very inconsistent. Salvino is backed up halfway through his end zone. And from the look of things, unless he gets off a real boomer here, good field position coming for the Tigers as Ludwig is set up at the Penn 46-yard line to receive it. They're coming, and they hit him again. No flag this time and no call as Penn gets a good bounce, and it's going to roll dead at the Princeton 48-yard line. I'll tell you what, Salvino got hit again. The referee was standing right there, Hennigan. He looked at it, and he decided no. Earlier in the game, the first Penn drive of the game was extended by a roughing the kicker call. This time, Salvino does no take the shot. No huddle here as Princeton's trying to conserve time, go right to the shotgun. Air the ball out a little bit, try and get some field position. They called the play on the sideline. 2.28 to go here, first half. First down and 10 to Kelly. Little sprint out, but he's not going to get away from Jason Mayer. Mayer coming down the line and across the field, drops him back at his own 38-yard line. That has to be busted. Somebody missed two blocks up front. Two guys came in clean. It looked to me like they didn't know what they were doing as far as this call goes, and Penn really put the pressure on Nikelny. Block running with 2.05 left in the half. Nikelny has Merrow in his face, and Merrow knocked it down. Well, he avoided getting hit by Merrow, but he couldn't get it over those big arms. His Mitch Merrow at 6'5", 289 presents an imposing target. There he is. You'll see him come right into your picture there. And he's just going to envelop you. Great athlete. What a story he is. Definitively the worst looking uniform in the Ivy League. Well, the arms cut off. you got to just try to work your way into that thing when you're that big. Third down now. Looks like we had a holding call coming against Princeton as a flag was thrown on the run by Brandt. He got it out to the 40-yard line, but I believe it is going to be a holding call against the Tigers. That's the other great defender for Penn, Zinzer, who came in to make the hit there for a short gain. They tried to run a little draw play on third down, but it's going to go against them with the call here. Hennigan does make the call. The preliminary call is holding. Flag came from the umpire, James Dinkle. Anytime you see that flag come from the umpire that quickly into a run, guaranteed you're talking about a hold. Holding on the offense. That's going to set a fourth down as Penn says no to the penalty. And they throw the pressure back on their punter, Evans. There's 155 left. Enough time for Penn here if they can get a return of some sort and get some field position. 
But Evans is a, is a very good kicker, left-footed kicker. Kicked the ball away from the return as many times. And that one off the side of his foot. May have gotten a piece of it, did the pen rush. Flag late on the play coming from the side judge. We got all kinds of things going on now as Penn's going to get good field position if it stands. Now, once again, the side judge came in and threw a late flag way away from the thrust of the play, and I believe the call is going to go against Penn. Interesting, because I think Parsons, here's the call, personal foul. Personal foul against Penn. Parsons got in there. He might have gotten his hand on that ball, at least deflected it, because it was a poor kick by Evans. Here's the referee. Well, there is Al Bagnoli, and he's obviously upset. I believe that it had to do with the uh, maybe an exchange of words after the play and away from the thrust of the play because it came from the near side of the field completely away from where anybody was except for the receiver. You didn't hear that, but what uh, Hennigan was saying, the referee, was it was a dead ball foul after after the exchange so it goes against Penn it pushes him back and gets him out of good field position so now Penn loses 15 yards wow Al Bagnoli giving an earful he said you wouldn't call spearing but you called that now Penn gets the carry on first down and look at it carrying defenders with him across the 42 yard line very powerful runner that time. He's building up, too, as he goes along. As you mentioned, he gets stronger as time goes on, and Al is really on his, on his team to get the play call and get going. He's looking at the clock with 122, and it's ticking off. He wants the hurry-up offense going. You saw Bagnoli saying, come on, we got to run this thing quickly. Time down to 112 left in the half as Raider looks to throw, and it is complete. Once again, nice catch made by Rodgers in Princeton territory for the first down. Rodgers is excellent. He concentrates on the football. That time again, the defender was all over him, and he makes the catch for the first down. Freshman Dave Rodgers, freshman Dominic McNeil, sophomore Doug O'Neill, all guys who have stepped up for the Penn receiving core this year. Under a minute to play in the half. This Raider has a blitz coming. He got away from it, and it's complete. This time, Doug O'Neill for first down yardage again inside the Princeton 34-yard line and down to the 33. And Penn calls for a timeout with 49 seconds left in the half. Excellent execution by Raider that time. He had pressure coming from the right side, forced him out of his setup, but let him look for the intermediate receiver, found him over the line of scrimmage and delivered the ball for the first down, turned around, called timeout, 49 seconds remain. Middle of the second quarter, here you see Raider coming out of trouble, just dumps the ball off right there, gets it to his receiver, number 28, who gets up field and gets the first down. Now he calls timeout, and Penn's in position with 49 seconds to get some more points. Now we've already seen that Great House is capable of hitting from a good distance, nailing a 44-yarder to start the scoring today. The wind, although it is a factor across the field, is not a factor whether you're going one way or the other. So now going in the other direction, you would assume that you set him up, he's got a shot at it. But, of course, Penn's not thinking about that right now. They want touchdown. Raider was just on the sideline talking to the offensive coordinator, Chuck Priori, getting his play calls. Probably got one or two plays called. In a situation like this, you want his experience in this position. He knows what he can do, and he knows how to execute. Lots of confidence here with Matt Raider. Four wide receiver set. Raider looking left and out, back right. He had a lot of time. Now dumping it off, and it's incomplete. Good job by Raider just to get rid of it as Griff King was bearing down on him from behind. Good job by the Princeton secondary, too. They defended the long pass, forced Raider out of the pocket, and he had to go to his outlet, which was Finn, the tailback. He looked one way and then looked the next, and everybody was covered. Right before Griff King got to him and pounded him into the turf, Raider did get rid of the football, and that stopped the clock and avoided a loss. So Penn still sits at the 33-yard line on second down and 10. Once again, a spread set with four wide receivers. And again, Princeton's coming blitz. Two linebackers coming, but it was the defensive lineman who got him. David Ferrara wraps him up, and the official's whistle blows back at the 42-yard line. Big loss of the play of nine yards. And Penn has to call for another timeout. 
They have to use the time up just to have a chance to make another play here. Coming up at halftime, don't forget, talking about the 89th game between these two teams, the rivalry between Penn and Princeton. Also a special trivia question for you. Jason Barr will be talking with a special Penn man. And some statistics coming up from the first half of play. You might want to take a good look at the rivalry feature because it does show some of the great moments in Penn Princeton history. A couple of the great players. A Heisman Trophy winner is included in that package. And absolutely no doubt the most memorable play of the last 20 years between the two teams. Actually, two of them probably come in 1-1-A, but they're both in there. So if you are a fan of this rivalry, you definitely want to stay tuned at halftime. Al Bagnoli on the field talking with Raider, getting his set up here as Penn going third and 19. Shotgun formation. On third down. Raiders got a rush coming, but time to throw. And that's going to be complete. Got Carson down to the 30-yard line. I think that they were looking for his field goal range, but a flag's down, and that might bring this one back with 23 seconds left. It looks to me there's, there's going to be a penalty here. It looks like holding again, unfortunately. That was a great delivery by Raider. They called the play they wanted. They want to get down to the 30-yard line, get out of bounds, stop the clock, and kick a field goal, or try to. And you see it here. Out of the shotgun, he sets up beautifully and delivers the football right on the sideline at the 30-yard line. The receiver catches it and steps out of bounds. Number three, of course, that was Carson, but they caught him with a hold. I believe that was your hold call right there from Chris Riley on the right tackle spot. And that's going to hurt Penn, obviously. This is going to drop them all the way back to their own 44-yard line. So a third down situation, not a lot of options. And now field goal range is, it would appear, no longer a possibility unless Raider can come up with a real big play now. Well, he's only going with two wide receivers on third down and a boatload to go. they got to get it down to the Princeton 23-yard line. Third and 33. It's going to be third and 38. <laughs> the right tackle moved. Once again, flag down on the play, and they're definitively going in the wrong direction with 23 seconds left in the half. Yep, third down and 38. All right, coach. What do I call? <laughs> yeah. What's that third and 38 play you got the tucked third away? third and 38 is get the ball on the ground and try and kill this clock and go off at halftime 10 nothing. If there weren't just 23 seconds after the half, you think quick kick in a situation like this. And the ball is on the ground. It's Finn's going to pound his way for it. He got it out to the 30, make that 44-yard line. Late flag thrown. That's going to stop the clock again with 13 seconds to go. I think Princeton was going to call for a timeout, but as it turned out, they didn't have to. Down on the play is Jason Lebrun. This penalty is going to go against Princeton. It may be a late hit. We'll see. The official, or perhaps a face mask. Five yards, right, he said? Don't worry, Steve. There's no such thing as a 38-yard penalty. <laughs> okay. There it is. Five yards after the play. 13 seconds left in the half. And it was five yards after the play. So what it does is it gives Penn one more crack at it here. But the clock starts because the penalty's against the defense. And I don't even think they're going to put it up. Right. Two seconds, one, and that'll do it for the first half of play. The Quakers will content themselves with a 10-point halftime lead. Mitch Merrow is back. He may only be at 80% health-wise, but 80% of Mitch Merrow is pretty good. 80% of Mitch Marrow dominates most 90% of the players in the Ivy League. He's a great football player. Chilly, damp day here in Philadelphia. And at halftime, the Quakers still alive in the Ivy League race with a 10-point lead. We'll be back right after this. This telecast of Princeton University football is sponsored in part by McCaffrey's Supermarkets. McCaffrey's, when they say fresh baked, they mean fresh. Baked from scratch by their talented professional bakers and pastry chefs right in their stores. McCaffrey's Supermarkets offers a wide variety of gourmet cakes, pastries, and breads. McCaffrey's, a supermarket experience in Princeton, West Windsor, and Yardley, Pennsylvania. 
Every few years, a family show comes along that captures America's art. Add Comedy Central's new show, South Park, to that list. <laughs> It'll make you laugh. Laugh all you want. I'm the one who's going to be on TV looking all buff. It'll make you cry. Do your impersonation of David Caruso's career! It'll make you puke. <laughs> Kids say the darndest things. Watch South Park, only at Comedy Central. Sometimes a mystery intrigues you. Sometimes a mystery excites you. And sometimes a mystery shocks you. But this time, these mysteries will never let you go. The a and &E Mystery Theater. It's amazing what some guys go through just to get an authentic NFL jersey. They should just watch the NFL team shop on QVC. Authentic NFL merchandise delivered right to your door. Pretty painless, really. But some guys never learn. Halftime here at Franklin Field with Penn leading Princeton by a 10 to nothing score. Now, when you talk about Penn and Princeton, most folks will generally tell you about basketball. In fact, one of the great college basketball rivalries ever takes place in the Ivy League each year as Penn and Princeton do battle. But the football side of the rivalry is one that dates back almost as long as the beginning of college football. It is certainly one that is rich in tradition and rich in very special moments. We thought we'd help you take a look back at it. It's been a long and exciting road for these two bitter Ivy rivals. But that is Jason Scott, big hole, and it could go. He's gone. And it didn't always look like this. In fact, the first Penn Princeton game was played in 1876 when football looked more like this. Played without benefit of helmets, pads, and apparently any good sense. In those early days of the rivalry, Princeton was dominant, winning the first 28 games played over the first 16 years. In 1887, the score was an incredible 96 to nothing. But there was a noticeable change in how the games were played, beginning with this one in 1892. For starters, they wore uniforms and had crowds. For another, Penn finally won by a 6-4 final in Mannheim, Pennsylvania. Suddenly, a rivalry was developing. Princeton won in 1893, and then came a legendary turning point. In 1894, Penn won the game played in Trenton, but the contest was amazingly brutal. The Princeton faculty had seen enough. In the interest of the safety of their players, they called off any future games with Penn, and the rivalry was sent into deep hibernation. It would be 41 years before the next game, played in front of a sold-out crowd at Palmer Stadium in 1935. Penn was a 500 team that year. However, Princeton had one of its greatest teams of all time. The Tigers squad was on its way to a perfect 9-0 record for the year and they welcomed Penn back to the battlefield with a hard-fought 7-6 win. For Penn, football fortunes turned in 1938 with the naming of George Munger as head coach. From 1938 to 1953, the Quakers led the nation in attendance. And behind players like four-time All-America Bob O'Dell, the Quakers also began to play winning football. The 1943 win over Princeton was a showcase for Odell and came in the middle of nine straight winning seasons for Penn. In 1949, Princeton trotted out its newest star, Dick Kazmaier, who would go on to win the Heisman Trophy three years later. His touchdown run gave Princeton the early lead in the 1949 game, but it was a short-lived celebration. Moments later, a missed extra point left the window of opportunity open. It was the difference as Penn won it 14-13. In 1952, Princeton had a 24-game win streak, but 
but the crowd at Palmer Stadium was shocked by Penn's upset win, Princeton's only loss of the season. The 1960s belonged to Princeton. The Tigers, in this 1963 game, beat Penn to begin a 140 to nothing final count over three seasons. The next year, Princeton had its only undefeated Ivy team. In the 1970s, the pendulum swung again. In 1974, Penn took the early lead and hung on for their third straight win over Princeton. In 1976, it was three field goals by Princeton's Paul Zubek to put the Tigers in front. But Bob Graustein threw a touchdown pass with 17 seconds left to give Penn the win. Down to the waiting moments again in 1982, Chris Price was the hero for Princeton. His 42-yard field goal with just 25 seconds left gave the Tigers the victory. For all the excitement, though, that one wasn't necessarily number one. For many Penn Princeton fans, that honor came the next year. In 1983, Derek Graham had a 95-yard touchdown catch, but Penn came back. And with seconds left on the clock, the Tigers scored to make it a one-point game. A true classic came down to a gutsy two-point conversion try. Penn hung on for the win and a second straight Ivy crown. Two years later, maybe the most memorable play in Penn Princeton history. Ten. Gets the kickoff, end over and fair catch, called for, but a lot of bounce and bounces back the other way. Out to the 19 yard line where he was touched. He picked it up, he's running for a touchdown. Chris Flynn with the ball. It's good. For Princeton fans, it was unfathomable. For Penn fans, it was almost a religious experience. A daring try on a never-before-seen play as Flynn swept in among five Princeton defenders to pick up the ball and run for the score. And after a lengthy conference among the officials, this one became part of history. Certainly the most hype battle came in 1993 with both teams at 7-0. Terrence Stokes ran for a Penn record 272 yards in the Penn win as Princeton's offense was frustrated all day long. Penn would go on to yet another Ivy League title. Truth be told, these teams are bitter rivals. Truth also be told, they're friendly rivals. And we expect a lot more from the Penn-Princeton rivalry in the years to come. Well, the next chapter of the rivalry being written here at Franklin Field today, and we are at halftime with a 10 to nothing Pennsylvania lead. Now, we have got to get an opportunity to test your brain just a little bit with some gridiron trivia today. Franklin Field, the site of the first football radio broadcast in 1922, but this, of course, is television. So we want to know where and when was the first televised football game. Give you a couple of moments to work on that, and we'll come up with an answer for you a bit later on. Is the Penn Band... Spells out Pennsylvania on the field by lying down. Team isn't doing much lying down, ho. They're trying to come back into the Ivy League race and taking another step here today, halfway through this one, with a 10-0 halftime lead. Ten-nothing at halftime with Penn leading Princeton in this Ivy League battle. Now, we gave you our trivia question and gave you a little bit of an opportunity to work on it. Told you about the first radio broadcast here in 1922. When and where was the first televised football game ever? Well, how about right here at Franklin Field in 1940? There's a look at it as Philco was doing it in a game between Penn and Maryland from all the way back in 1940 in the second tier here at Franklin Field. As we continue here at halftime now, time to take you down on the field to our own Jason Barr, who's standing by with a special guest. All right, thanks very much, Scott. Penn Van performing right here, and I'm with George Weiss. Wharton 65, who serves on the Board of Trustees at Penn and also on the Athletic Advisory Board. Quakers up 10-0 at halftime, but a little bit of a sloppy game, four turnovers, but I know you're very happy, uh, Ben, on with a 10-point lead. Well, anytime you beat Princeton, it's a great day. It's not perfect weather, but we'll get it going in the second half. And uh, you're on the Athletic Advisory Board, and I know one thing that you said is you would like to have a field house for dear old Penn. What, what would that bring? The, I think one thing that's missing in the complex is I think the students at the university needed a recreation area to work out, but I also think the, uh, the university for the last 25, 30 years has needed a field house so our students compete on an equitable basis with the other schools. 
And you're very generous in giving money back to Penn. I know there was a, a dinner last night in which you set up a scholarship program, $500,000 uh, in the name of Dan Staferi, the Penn assistant coach. And for those of you who aren't sure who Dan Staferi is, he's the guy on the sidelines in the red plaid pants and the red sport jacket that's always going nuts and uh, rooting Penn on. He's quite a character. Well, Coach Lake, as the kids call him, is one of the finest human beings that you ever want to meet. And he's so great for the kids, and he gives them sort of like a parent away from home. The gentleman is 76 years of age, and if we have the energy that he has, he's just a phenomenal human being. And what I basically have done is challenged the Pennsylvania football players in the last 20 years to stand up to the plate and help contribute to a Coach Lake fund. And we'll hopefully get a million dollars together and make Penn even a greater uh, football program. I know you, you did $500,000, now you just say you want to do it, uh, raise a million. How important is that for some of the younger alumni to give back? I know you love this university and you want to, you want to make it see, uh, stay great. Well, to, to continue the greatness that, uh, that is Pennsylvania, it takes a lot of you know, different things that alumni can do. It's not only contributing money, but it's also getting involved, interviewing students, recruiting students. This thing doesn't happen. Being number seven in the U.S. News and World Report doesn't happen by accident. We all have to pitch in, work together. To and Quakers doing a good job. We're at halftime. I'm Jason Barr, joined by George Weiss. Quakers leading at 10 nothing. And also, you're uh, very big in the martial arts, aren't you? You're, you're a second-degree black belt. Correct me if I'm wrong, and you're in a Taekwondo, right? What's, uh, and you brought uh, some people in to talk to some of the players, and I know you got a couple of guys, the bug. They got the bug now, martial arts. They're into it. Does it help them on the field at all, you, you were saying? Basically, uh, what martial arts does, and obviously there's some limitations because you don't want to literally kill Princeton. You just want to beat them. They, uh... <laughs> That's a good one. The, uh, basically what you do is you're really talking about balance, leverage, using the opponent's strength against them. So there are some uh, very fine ways that you can use some of the skills that you develop. Another charity that you're very much into is Say Yes to uh, Education, in which you sponsor and really um, back many inner city kids. I believe you were telling me earlier, 57 of them and you help them go to college, no, or 50 of them are in college now, correct me, and uh, tell me a little bit about what you do. CES Education is an educational foundation that is domiciled at the Graduate School of Education here at Penn. There are 308 inner city kids, Philadelphia, Hartford, and uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, that are involved in the program. The older group that is domiciled here in Philadelphia and West Philadelphia of the 112 kids in the program, there are 50, 53 kids in college, two attending the University of Pennsylvania. What's really exciting is we have a group coming up in Hartford that are now seniors in high school that we started with in the fourth grade, and we have a very extensive social service program, heavy academic workload, summer school. Of the 76 kids, 50 are going to go on to college. There's only one teenage pregnancy in the group. There's no drug arrest. And what's really exciting is that seven or eight of them can get into Penn on their own. And I'll tell you, if I have to cut a check, I'd much rather cut a check for a kid to go to Durham, Pennsylvania. <laughs> All right, that's wonderful. You're very generous, and thanks so much for the interview. Okay. Nice okay. George Thank Weiss, Wharton 65. Let's go back up to Scott and Bob. Well, Jason, what we've seen here so far today as we look at a 10 to nothing Penn lead here at halftime is a game that had a little different feel early on and kind of changed around later on in the game. In fact, as far as Princeton was concerned, things got started with a turnover early in the game, Bob. Early in the game, a Princeton turnover right here. The sack on the quarterback, McKinley, as Big Marrow comes through. Watch the play here. He hits him, knocks him down. There's the, the ball on the, the ground, the fumble recovery, which leads, of course, to the opportunity for a field goal. And it was Jeremiah Greathouse nailing it from 44 yards away with a heavy crosswind, but never a doubt about it as he drills it through for a 3-0 lead. And a little bit later on, Matt Rader going up top, find that he's back up tight end. Bootleg action, he goes deep here to Zagorski, gets him down inside the 10-yard line, actually inside the 5-yard line. This play led, of course, to great field position for him. Rader was really a factor all in the second half, particularly the second quarter, as Finn goes in and gets the score to put him up. Well, Finn went up over the top, and now his ninth touchdown on the ground this year. He has been Mr. Everything on the ground, but so far the first half dictated by what Penn's been able to do through the air. And right now, they've got 10 nothing halftime lead. We'll be back with a look at first half statistics and more here at Franklin Field in a moment.
It's amazing what some guys go through just to get an authentic NFL jersey. They should just watch the NFL team shop on QVC. Authentic NFL merchandise delivered right to your door. Pretty painless, really. But some guys never learn. Statistics show that 40% of all kids who smoke marijuana live in the city. Guess where the other 60% live? The best cable channels can only be found in RCN's Family Value Package. RCN's Family Value Package is the complete cable package. Call 1-800-321-0544. Every few years, a family show comes along that captures America's heart. Add Comedy Central's new show, South Park, to that list. <laughs> It'll make you laugh. Laugh all you want. I'm the one who's gonna be on TV, looking all buff. It'll make you cry. Do your impersonation of David Caruso's career! It'll make you puke. <laughs> Kids say the darndest things. Watch South Park, only at Comedy Central. Five nights of glory. Five nights of human drama. Five nights of turmoil. A&E's biography reveals the stories of fascinating lives five nights a week. Five nights of the extraordinary lives of extraordinary people on A&E's biography. Brought to you by this fine sponsor. Taste of something make you feel good? Leave me alone. A little crack won't hurt you. I said no, man. Good job, son. That's just what you do if that ever happens. Hey, Dad. 10 0 Penn leading it at halftime as the Quakers will get the ball to start the second half of play, but. We've already got, you know, the beginnings of a couple of things that are going on here that we have seen a little bit about, which we'll report on for you momentarily. Here is Steve Tosh, the head coach of the Princeton Tigers. His team has been successful two of the last three times they played here at Franklin Field. And as far as the first half went, his team just did not get a whole lot started offensively. We'll see what happens here in the second half. Rossignol is back deep along with Finn to take the Princeton kickoff. The ball is teed up by Greg Norman. Norman's done a good job this year of blasting it down end zone side. Got that one down to the five as Rossignol takes it up the middle. And his forward progress is going to get him out to the 20-yard line for first down and 10 yards to go for the Quakers. Take a look at your first half statistics. Mitch Merrill was a big impact player, but Penn got it done through the air with 125 yards passing. Neither team has run the ball especially well here today, and there were seven first-half penalties to go along with four first-half turnovers. There's been the difference, though, in the first half. He came alive in the second quarter, Matt Rader, and he has really taken control of this offense with lots of confidence and made the deliveries, throwing the football in key situations. First down and 10 now, and here comes a big blitz. Ludwig got him, and then two more Princeton defenders right on top of him to finish the job, but it was Ludwig coming on a safety blitz from around the outside that helped drop Raider back to the 12-yard line. And you said that Raider had been a difference. That he has been, throwing for 75 yards more than his competition in the first half. And the one interception came as he was hit. He really has not thrown the ball badly at all. And a couple of big plays at more than 30 yards set up the Penn touchdown. And Raider now backed up into a hole. He's got a second down and 18 situation now. Finn running the ball, nowhere to go. What a nice play made on the defensive line by Brett Marshall. The safety came up to help stuff the run. He shed a block and with one right hand came up with a big tackle. Princeton's challenging him here. They figure they're not going to put the ball up. They're deep in their own territory. They come in with 10 men up on the line of scrimmage, and that's the kind of pursuit you get. And look what they do. They cross them. They force the ball back inside the 10-yard line. They're looking to create something here. The defense has done it all year. You see four white jerseys on the ball carrier. 
So Ben going straight backwards now, back up to their own nine-yard line, and there is Brett Marshall, the senior out of San Diego. And a whistle on the play as Raider was set to go back to throw on third down. And we've got another penalty coming up that may very well be against Penn and moving back a little bit further. Undoubtedly, Steve Tosh has told his team at halftime, if we're going to win this ball game, we've got to create something. We've got to gamble, go after people, leave it to his defense. They're trying right now. Well, he's got his team in a great situation right now as the defense, if they can step up here, is going to make Penn punt from the end zone. Procedure is the call made by Dennis Hennigan, and they move back now to the four-yard line. So third down and 26 is the call. Quakers hitting at 33% of their third down conversions today, but this was a tall order. Raider way up top and incomplete. A little contact at the end of the play, but Penn is going to be forced to punt. Now Princeton going to get the ball back, and something may be going on there. Let's take it out of the field and check in with Jason Barr. That's right, Scott. Something is going on. I talked with Princeton head coach Steve Tosh just coming out of halftime. Apparently, quarterback Kerry Nakilney has been taken to the hospital. He got x-rays. They think he might have cracked ribs. So we're going to see the backup, uh, John Burnham, in. I also talked to Al Bagnoli. He said, we've got to shut down the Princeton running game. He also thought that maybe 10 points wasn't enough. Again, Quakers leading at 10 nothing. Back upstairs. Good job, Jason. Thank you from down on the sidelines. And Salvino backed up against the edge of the goal line as he gets rid of it. A little end-over-end kick. Ludwig fields and gets destroyed back losing yardage after the catch forward progress stops at the 39 yard line so Princeton's going to go with a new quarterback great field position to start the second half as they'll take over on the Penn 39 this telecast of Princeton University football is sponsored in part by McCaffrey's supermarkets McCaffrey's in the business of satisfying customers. In fact, McCaffrey's guarantees the highest quality in everything they offer. Market fresh fruits and vegetables, oven fresh baked breads, pastries, cakes, and gourmet prepared meals ready to eat and heat. McCaffrey's, a supermarket experience in Princeton, West Windsor, and Yardley, Pennsylvania. If you smoke pot one time, it probably won't kill you. But if you keep smoking it, you might just get dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber. Did you know that eating hot dogs can make a kid 46% less likely to use drugs? Be a mentor. Make a difference. John Burnham, his teammates and friends call him Jackie. Two for nine for 11 yards. All of that came last week as he came on a relief in the loss to Columbia by a 17 to nothing score. And now Burnham, the junior out of Washington, D.C., who missed his freshman year with a shoulder injury, comes on to replace the injured Harry McKelney. Princeton with great field position to start the second half. First and 10 for the Penn 39 yard line. Movement on the line, and we have got a procedure call going to come against Jason Glotzbeck, the tight end, who came flying off the line before the count. And that's not unusual. New quarterback in, new cadence, everybody up on the line of scrimmage with the tension on him, and that's just jumped offside. They've got to get used to Burnham. Sure, they work with him in practice, but this is a game situation. And the call for the official is indeed procedure, as it was Glotzbeck who was firing off the line. As a matter of fact, that's probably a pretty good tip-off as to what the first play was as Glossback was moving out into the area behind the linebackers and in front of the safeties. But to find out what Burnham is capable of doing. As he steps in now to a good situation. First and 15 now from the 44. Penn's not coming hard right away, but Marrow's coming. Now Burnham runs away from him and throws. And Cano makes the catch, getting it down to the 40-yard line. Four-yard pickup on first down, but wisely they take the quarterback in the game for the first play, Bob, and run him away from Mitch Marrow. Away from Mitch Marrow, and they give him a chance to throw the ball. Give him a, a fairly comfortable and safe pass, a little sideline cut by Canole, and he makes the catch on the sideline, picks up about five yards. Of course, Mitch Marrow tried to get around Justin Bennett, and of course he did. Now, one little hit kind of slowed him up a little bit, though, as it came from the guard, Hamid Abdullah. Play action. Marrow giving chase again. Burnham's going to run it. Nice play made by Bishop and Beckwith to knock him down at the 37-yard line after a pickup of three yards. 
So third down coming up. That almost looked like a sprint all the way with the idea of running the football to get on the corner, which he did. Got some yardage out of it, but I'm not sure that you want to expose your quarterback, your backup quarterback this early in the game with the run. John Bishop receiving special honors at halftime. One of the great scholar athletes in all of the Ivy League and a guy who is a finalist for a Rhodes Scholarship. Two for six in the third down conversions today for Princeton. That's right around the season average. Burnham gets it knocked back at himself. Larry Roscoe got the hand up and rejected it as you would with a shot in basketball. Great pressure again from the Penn defense by Marrow and Zinser, but it was a step behind Larry Roscoe who swatted it away. Jackie Burnham meet Mitch Marrow. This is what it comes down to. There he is right there on the outside. Three guys converge. Great pass rush by Penn to keep him in the pocket. But of course, Princeton with a great kicking game is going to try something here. At least they thought they were for a minute, but they changed their mind. I thought Cirque would have the chance. If he was going to have the chance, it would have been for a 54-yard field goal, which would have been by far his long of his career. Now, it's going to be Matt Evans. On to punt it away as Piello stands back at his own 10. And that ball is drilled toward the corner and out. And they are going to mark that one out at the four-yard line. So for the 10th time this year, Evans has drilled one inside the 10-yard line, inside the 20. And Penn, with some tough field position as the offense comes down, getting ready for the drive as they start in their own four. But again, missed opportunities here early in the third quarter. Princeton gets the ball back on the Penn 40-yard line, comes up with nothing. So they've got to capitalize on this. Sooner or later, it's going to turn the tide. Raider leading his team out, and one of the things that Penn doesn't want to do is they don't want to sit on top of a 10-point lead. You heard Jason Barr tell us that Al Bagnoli said that 10's probably not going to be enough. James is the man in motion, and Jim Finn gets into the Princeton secondary out at about the 8-yard line after a pickup of 4. Good blocking on the right side by Penn's offensive line that time behind Konish and Riley, the right tackle. They came up in a too tight formation, two tight ends, wing back, just running the football, keep possession, picked up four yards. There's a look at the Princeton defensive line. And Penn led by Matt Rader, the junior out of Yardley, Pennsylvania, at Pennsbury High School. He's got to get his team out to the 14-yard line for a first down. Finn again, nice block by Cornish, pulling from the guard spot, but good recognition made by Griff King as he takes him down at the 11-yard line after a pickup of just two. Trying to run a little counter play with the tailback, Finn. Here you see him starting to the right, brings the ball back to the, the left side, but watch 94, play off the block here. Excellent position by King to hold him to a short game. Once again, it was Konish coming down the line as the pulling guard that threw a nice block. It looked like it was going to spring that for a lot more. That's off to Griff King on a nice play. So now a third down situation, third and three. That's James in motion. They're sticking on the ground, and Finn gets his feet taken out from under him. Credit Mark Whaling for great penetration into the backfield. And a nice-looking play down low for the Princeton defensive unit as they're going to force Penn to punt it away. 51 uh, Whaling has been uh, singled out by Steve Tosh. This is one of the three guys on defense who has been outstanding all year. Mark Whaling is a senior coming out of Chappaqua, New York. So for the second time in a row now, Salvino's got to punt it from his own end zone. And one way or another, these eventually end up jumping up to bite you if you do it too much. Nearly did, and it did. Princeton just going to let it roll, and it's going to get hit by Penn at the 22-yard line. A 12-yard kick for Salvino on a botched snap, and then it looked as though he tried to rush it just to get it away and misfired on the kick. That's it. The opportunity they've been looking for as you look at the Princeton bench. Here's the snap. It bounces along. He did well to feel that football, believe me, and it looked like he might have even gotten a hand on it. Scooped it up just the way they do it in practice. They practice that routine on a bad snap. Now he got it right off his toe and hit it end over end. So now, another great position for Jackie Burnham, the backup quarterback. Not a lot of pressure here as he hands off to Kyle Grant. And a carry gets down to about the 19-yard line. Looks like there might have been a flag thrown in there late. And from the area of the flag, that doesn't look good for Princeton. Mitch Marrow is down on the play, and they are 
making sure he's all right as he's a little bit slow to get up. But they get your preliminary call, and it is a hold on the Tigers. As a head coach, you're down inside the other team's 25-yard line with a first down play, and you get a hold on a running play. That's got to drive you nuts. Yes, exactly, and that's what is going through the mind of Steve Toshis. Tough call. He doesn't want to believe it, that's for sure. Now, once again, holding is one of those judgment calls on the part of officials where the old line is that holding can be called on almost any play in any given football game, depending upon when the official decides to throw the flag. For Steve Toshis, that was a bad time. Now his team backed up to the 30-yard line and first down still. Burnham. A little bit of time. And now he wants to run. He got the quarter turn past Gage. And flies out of bounds. Gage was the guy pursuing, and Burnham got around him and down to the 24-yard line. Good judgment on the part of Burnham that time. His receivers were covered well. He decided to hold, 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 and he ran with the football and got some yardage out of it. He didn't just put it up with a lot of uh, bad consequences. Here we see him, a little drop-back action as he starts to roll to the right, looks downfield, decides right now he's going to keep the football, and he does. Good speed to the outside as Gage couldn't quite get there. And then to the safety of the sideline, a little bit of a late hit, but no flag from the officials. Now it's going to be a second down and 12. First time today for Burnham out of the shotgun. And a flag thrown, a delay of game call coming against Princeton. So from second and 12, it turns into second and 17, and the penalty is really starting to add up against Princeton now here in the third quarter. This is so difficult for a football team. They get themselves in great field position. They come up with this first series. They got two key penalties to go against them. Now obviously, Penn is looking for what would be a very big lift emotionally if they can turn Princeton away without scoring or with just a field goal and two possessions inside their 30. Second down, again out of the gun. Burnham all day to throw it, and he does complete to Canal. Down to the 16-yard line, Burnham stepping up and firing a 13-yard completion. Great delivery on the part of the quarterback, Burnham. Excellent pattern by Cano. He came down and ran a curl pattern, got himself in position where he had to catch the ball or he's going to be interfered with. Watch the delivery there. Watch him come back and make the catch. Good execution, first down. Excuse me, third down. They were so far away. I'm losing sight of the, of the sticks down there. Third and about four. Burnham again is going to operate out of the shotgun with two receivers to his right. Looking left all the way. There's the throw, and it's incomplete. He had a receiver and put the ball right on target, but it didn't appear that Ken Navarez thought it was coming. Incomplete down at the two-yard line. And now a fourth down situation. Down by 10. You expect Princeton to take the points. I think you do. Here it is. Again, he's looking for uh, Navarez down there running another curl pattern or coming back. A sideline cut. He catches this football eventually, but he's out of bounds. Nice catch, but too little and a little bit too late. There's where he would have had to have had control of it, and he didn't. So now a 33-yard field goal attempt for Alex Sirk, who hasn't missed this year. He's 11 for 11 on field goal tries. And the kick is good. Make it 12 for 12 now for Alex Sirk. And Princeton is on the board. After being dominated for a good part of the first half, they cash in on some good field position here in the third quarter, and they are now within a touchdown and a point. Let's take you down to the field now once again to Jason Barr. All right, thanks very much, Scott. I'm with one of the NFL's all-time greats who's here at Franklin Field today, Franco Harris. Good to see you. What brings you by to Franklin Field? Thank you very much. Uh, my son goes to Princeton, and uh, his buddies go to Penn, so I'm here with the... Uh, family of the kids that go to Penn and my son I said mentioned goes to Princeton so we're here just uh, having a good time get, get, get getting together with our kids and watching the football game do any of them play football no they don't uh, uh, but uh, we're definitely uh, big fans and and the one family uh, who that we're with their son he's in the band Oh, okay so, that's just important at Penn and Princeton especially, almost <laughs> especially today when uh, you know they're uh, uh, you know what uh, celebrating 100 years of Penn's band and he's a freshman here, so it's, it's, it's just nice enjoying all the festivities here. Tell me what you think of today's game. 
Uh, right now, it doesn't look too good for uh, Princeton to go to score is 10 to 10 to three. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm I'm just enjoying it. Uh, it's my first time going or coming to an Ivy League game, and I see all the championship Penn has up there on the uh, up on the board. So I'm I'm uh, pretty impressed. Yeah, uh, you had four nice championships yourself in the 70s, and. We always see still on TV today that immaculate reception. Do you, you see that a lot? Does it still make you feel good when you see it? Well, it's hard to believe, but this year we're celebrating celebrating the 25th anniversary of that catch. It's wow. Hard, it's hard to believe that that was 25 years ago, but uh, that was the start of a great decade of Pittsburgh Steelers football, and uh, and and we just feel that was a very special time, and a lot of you know play with a lot of special people, great uh, great football players, so. It was special, but I still enjoy the game, and uh, uh, coming out here watching the football game, it's, it's, it's always a thrill. All right, well, thanks for a few minutes. That was real nice of you to, uh, to give us some time, and good luck. Thank good you luck very much. your son. Thank you very much. All right, Franco Harris with the NFL's all-time greats. Back up to Scott and Bob. You sure got that right. Hand off to Finn now on first down, and now it's starting to go, and Finn could go down the right side. Ludwig's the only one who could catch him, and he does inside the 10-yard line. Straight down the right sideline like a bullet, Jim Finn has put Penn in the red zone. What a turnaround. Just a stretch play. He gets outside. He shows some speed here. Gets up on the sideline. Gets outside the contained man, 21 there, the cornerback. And now it's a foot race with Ludwig, the, free, the, the strong safety, finally catching. Big play, though, for Penn off offensively to come back from that field goal and make the play. Here it is again. Just saw, Brandon, just saw Brandon Carson, the wide receiver, and he kind of tied up the contain man, Jerry Wilson, and Finn just went flying right by. First down, goal to go for Penn at the 10-yard line. Off the big run by Finn. They're going to try to break it open right here. Option play could have been a busted play, and Raider gets dropped. Right at the line of scrimmage. I don't think that's what it was supposed to be. Jamie Toddings came in to make the hit for Princeton. Big play by Toddings. He stayed on the line of scrimmage and waited for the quarterback to come to him. Uh, it is unusual to see Raider running the football. He's basically a passer. So uh, that might be a little uh, twist that uh, Al Bagnoli put in for this game. It looks like it is an option as he comes down the line. He decides to keep it. Not take the chance of putting it on the ground with the pitch. So now Penn is looking at a second and long. Rossi Nolan Notion on second and goal. Finn again through the middle with a lead block, got it down to the five. Nice lead blocking from his backfield mate on the play. TJ Trapp, the fullback, opened up a big hole and a gain of five. Good job, too, on the left side by the offensive left side of Penn. LeBron and Cooney again making some big yardage in there for him to give Finn the big back a chance to run up behind him. Finn already has the one score here today. Nine rushing touchdowns on the air, but now on a third down and goal from the five, you would think they might be going to the air. That's James in motion. Play action. Big pursuit coming. Raiders going to try to run it in himself. And he's in. Touchdown, Matt Raider. Sheer determination. Raider just decided he was going to get into the end zone, and he just runs through tacklers here to make it there. But let's not forget, he's six foot four, and he's got some size, and he shows some speed there. Just a big play by a great competitor, Matt Raider. I am so impressed with his efforts today. That shows you what kind of an athlete he is. Great house for the extra point, and the Quakers now have a 14-point lead. Big play by Matt Raider, making like a fullback on a straight carry around the right side. And Raider used a lot of his size and weight package at 6'4", 235 to bang off a couple of tacklers, and he was not going to get denied that end zone once he got close. He was not going to get denied. you got to remember, Matt Raider was a, a recruited athlete out of Pensbury High School. I, we mentioned already what a tremendous student he was, and he had several options, and he went to Duke. And here you see him right now. This is a pure, fake 
the stretch play to his tailback, puts him out in front. Finn is blocking for him. Now watch him just turn up here with a lot of determination. Runs through King, the defensive end, through Damani Leach. Wow. And the secondary wow. to get into the end zone. Now you'll see the blocker sliding down the line. When your quarterback is out there, you're going to do everything you can to protect him. This is student body right. Exactly. Student body right and a great effort by Raider. And there it is. Big wow. hit there by Leach. Doesn't do anything. He just falls off of that. Makes the play into the end zone. He took two huge shots. Apparently, we're very close to when they have to throw the toast. Not unlike the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Or is he going to get stopped? Curran Rogers finally came in to help out with that final hit. And the tackle was made for Penn by T.J. Trapp. And now the ball at the 33-yard line. First and 10 with 6.20 to go in the third. Princeton comes out, gets some momentum, gets good field position, comes away with three points, and Penn answers with a long run by Finn and a touchdown by Raider right back, gets him in this game. That was a very important play for Penn offensively to come back right after Princeton seemed to have some momentum and field position. So now Jackie Byrne in the backup quarterback sees his team down by two scores. Got to get the team moving. With about 21 and a half minutes left in this one. Barrow almost got him, but now Burnham comes free and throws incomplete. He was looking for the tight end blocks back. Nice play to get away from Mitch Barrow as the Quakers try to hang the Tigers out to dry. It's going to be second down. Good coverage in the secondary that time by Penn. Number 40 was right there. That was Roger Blackwell. Crowd right now enjoying it. And they saw another 80-yard drive, the second 80-yard drive for the Quakers for a score today. Raider with a highlight goal play to cap it off. Now Burnham, who's two for five throwing the ball, drops into the gun. Big blitz coming. Found the open man complete to Cano. First down yardage out to the 49-yard line. Again, he's thrown to the experienced receiver in this offense for Princeton. That's uh, Ray Cano, the junior. Comes back to the football, goes down far enough to make the sticks, gets the first down yardage, and he delivers the ball to him right here for a first down. An important first down, not only for the Princeton offense, but for the quarterback, and that is Jackie Burnham, building confidence as he goes along here. His third complete pass here in the third quarter after coming out for the injured Harry McKelney. McKelney left with suspected broken ribs. He's at the hospital. Burnham's throw here, incomplete. A little bit low, but I think a... An experienced receiver like Ray Cano has got to come back and catch that ball. One man's opinion. That's good. That's fine. And he, he probably should have come back and he should have made that catch. It was a little bit low for him, but he should have made that catch. you got to make those catches. You're going to win the game. But he's made a lot so far this year. As we look at Princeton offensively, they've pretty much decided they're going to throw the football here. They're lining up in first down, now second down in the shotgun. Now trailing by 14 points, they're not a quick strike team, so they're going to try to get it back in bits through the air. Burnham's got a rush coming again. He's throwing again and is incomplete behind the intended receiver. Lauren Robertson was right there to put up a hand and make sure that nothing was going to happen as the ball was thrown behind Ken Navarez. That's exactly right. The ball was thrown a little bit behind him that time. He had him open. You, you said earlier they're going to try it. I said they're going to do it with a passing game. You said yes, with bits and pieces. That's exactly the kind of offense that Steve Toshis wants to get out of his passing game. He wants a controlled passing offense. Six, eight, 10, 12 yards, get the first down. Here's the replay. You see the ball's behind him. He never really had a chance to make the play. Good throw, and they had the first down. Now third down, and the throw again is complete. Perfect throw and catch as Hendler brings it in at the pen 32. That's big time. That is a great catch by Hendler. That's a slant pattern, well covered as we see it here. The ball is delivered by Burnham, and he makes a catch with people all over him in traffic for the first down. Again, another replay from ground level. There he comes. Hendler makes the catch on the slant. Nice throw by Burnham into traffic. He knew right where he wanted to put it, and Phil Wendler was right there to bring it in. Back to the ground they go. Puzio is there, and a late hit from Rasco as he leaped out of the back of the ball carrier, Gerald Gerardo. There's a look over at the sidelines as Matt Rader gets his counseling session, and they're trying to make sure that he's okay. He took a couple of real stiff shots on that touchdown run. 
Well, he may be okay. There's a couple of guys out on the turf for Penn who may not be. A little bit of a collision down there, and there are two different players for the Quakers that are down right now. One of them is James Hisgin. He's okay. Here comes Hisgin looking off. And I believe the other guy might on the ground be Beckwith. I'm not positive about that. Hard to tell from this angle. It is Beckwith. And apparently he's okay as well. And there's a look at Tom McLeod who's warming up for Pennsylvania. Quakers got the touchdown from Matt Rader, but they may have paid a heavy price for it if Rader right now is unable to continue. Al Bagnoli is going to have to make that decision, and his first-string quarterback is still sitting on the bench being talked to by the medical staff. And you, you're right. He's looking at him. You know, it might be that he, he got a head injury of some sort. He's questioning that right now. He's talking to him as if he might have some kind of a concussion. Burnham has hit on four of his passes so far. He's got second down now. Looking right all the way. And there's Gerardo trying to make the first bad miss, but Bishop lasses him out of bounds at the 27-yard line. After a three-yard pickup, it's going to be a third down situation now, third and five. Slid the tail back into the flat and delivered the ball as he was running. Here we look at uh, our quarterback. Now, right now, just trying to get an idea, doing a little lip reading here to find out what kind of questions they're asking him, but... You wonder whether or not you just try to make sure that he's got all of his faculties straight right exactly. now. Exactly. Eyes do look a little bit glazed. Third down and five. Another big third down for Jackie Burnham. All kinds of time. Now the throw late and complete for the first down. Navarez again inside the 15-yard line and down to the 13. Again, a big throw for Burnham. And all of a sudden, the Princeton quarterback has a lot of time to throw the ball. Mitch Marrow out of the game. Princeton beat able to defend give him time to find that crossing receiver as you see here and the play happens as he makes the completion again you look he had plenty of time to step up in the pocket marrow is back in the game he's the guy that creates disaster in there by putting the pressure on the quarterback well they took advantage of that now marrow is back but princeton's not at the pen door at the 13 yard line first back through is clifford maybe a gain of about a yard down to the pen 12. Again, the confidence building in Burnham. He's made some key completions here, particularly on third down situations. He's a junior. He's 6'3", 205 pounds. As we look back on the Penn quarterback, Matt Rader. Just asking questions, who he is, what his, where he lives, what his grade point average is. What day this is. <laughs> Flag on the play. I think Penn's going to get hit for a late hit no. as Marrow was on top of Burnham. And indeed, it will be a face mask call on Pennsylvania. That's a big break for Princeton. Tough break for Penn. That pass was the fullback in the flat. He was wide open. Nice delivery over the defender by number four here, Burnham. And Clifford looked like he wanted to run before he caught the ball. He saw that end zone close by, and he dropped it. You'll see it here. Nice little touch here on the part of the quarterback to get it over the defender as you look to the left of the screen here as this play would develop. There's the face mask right down on the lower right. And you see the face mask. There's the delivery. There's the catch oh. and the drop. You talked about touch. That's the exact right word. Face mask is the call. And now the ball's out at the Pennsylvania seven-yard line. But touch was the right call there because Burnham put the ball beautifully up over the top of a leaping Roger Beckwith. And right into the breadbasket of Mike Clifford. So now a second down. They've got to get it down to the three-yard line. Princeton trying to claw back in down 14. Off play action. Burnham firing. Incomplete. It's incomplete. For a moment, it looked as though Robertson might have had the interception, but the official rules that he was... Out of bounds, Richard Sawchuck right on top of the play said that Robertson was not in bounds when he caught the ball. And so Princeton dodges a bullet. Again, here's the roll going back to the weak side. He's looking in the corner to deliver the football. But watch Robertson, number 24, just come in there close, make a great play in the football. He's already made a key interception or a great defense early in the first half, which led to an interception. But there he is. 
making the play on the receiver in the corner. That's one foot in right there. And there's one foot in. Wow. You know whether he has control is the big question, yep. and that's what he's probably calling on. He was looking to deliver the ball that time to Windler, his wide receiver. Well, when you talk about the two teams that you're seeing here today with a timeout on the field, they are very much a part of college football history, and I'm talking about to the beginning of history and the most successful programs in all of college football history. Al Bagnoli and Steve Tosh is picking up the mantle for the number four and five teams all time among NCAA winners. It's a great history right there, and there are the five great football teams over the years. And of course, the, the Yale, the Princeton, the Penn wins, a lot of them came early in the, in the history of this game, but still, the last 10 years, as you've recorded, have been very successful ones, particularly for Penn and Princeton. And we told you about the beginning of the series at halftime that Princeton won the first 28 games played. Since that time, it's been a very competitive series exactly because of moments like this. 14-point game. This is the 11th play of the drive. And a third down and four. That's Gerardo in motion. Burnham with a big blitz coming. Fires over the top of it and incomplete. He had big pressure coming from Zinser. Or was that Merrill that was coming at him? And Ferguson coming out of blitz. Watch Ferguson here. No, Ferguson covering the defender there. Step for step with him. He, he was in such good position, number 11. As Burnham delivers the football here, he's got to put it to the outside. As you see, he's got to put it a little bit wide to get away from the defender. Just too long, too far away for the receiver. And it was indeed Zinser who was applying the pressure coming from the defensive left side. So now Cirque, who has already hit here today, and it's 12 for 12 on the year, and we'll try to get Princeton within 11. Just a walk in the park. Still tough, though. Great field position for Princeton all this third quarter, and they look up on the clock with 2.53 remaining in the third quarter, and they've only come away with six points. Now Princeton having trouble getting into the end zone on Penn, but that's nothing new. Penn is a stingy team lately about allowing touchdowns from the defensive side of the football. Last week, they did not allow one. They gave up just seven points against Yale, and it came on an interception return for a touchdown. The week before, we were here, and they gave up a late score very late in the game to Brown in the defensive unit. And the week before that, they allowed only one touchdown to Columbia. The week before that, now that was the beginning of things because they lost to Lehigh 24-7, to and since that time, they've really turned the season around. I think they've turned the season around both offensively with the development of Matt Rader getting more confidence in the offense and, of course, the return and, the, and, and more play out of their great defensive tackle, Merrill. Number 11. Jim Finn hasn't hurt. No, oh, excuse me. C coming That's in the other just, addition. Coming in and just manning the offensive unit. His big run down the right sideline, a little bit ago on the most recent drive is what set Penn up. And Penn is going to be going, as we see the look at the drive, Penn's going to be going to another quarterback to start this next drive because Raider is still on the bench wearing a jacket now and no helmet. Long kick is going to go out of bounds. And so it will be a penalty, and Penn will get the ball in good shape. Let's take it down now to Jason Bard. That's right, Scott. The new quarterback for Penn will be Tom McLeod. Earlier you saw Matt Raider being worked on. They're not saying anything other than he isn't feeling very well and he's very banged up, so Penn will go with another quarterback. If I can get more word, I'll pass it along. Back upstairs. Now, once again, Jason, we were talking a little while ago about the fact that that touchdown was a heroic run for Matt Raider, but one wonders about the price they may have paid. Now, Tom McLeod, who's 6 for 13 on the season, made four starts last year, and an experienced player, a senior out of Kettering, Ohio, he comes on to man things, and you can imagine that Penn's probably going to keep it on the ground. On first down for the 35. That's Finn. And good yardage as he got it out near the 40-yard line. What an interesting development in this game. Such a, a, a good rivalry, such a key game for both teams in many respects. And both of them end up going into the fourth quarter without their starting quarterbacks. Well, we did not exactly see how Nikelny got hit in the ribs that knocked him out of the game, but we saw very graphically and very clearly, Raider was not going to be denied the end zone, and he paid a big price for getting there. Wakers by 11 as the time runs down in the third quarter, second down and five. Once again, it's Finn. Running into Griff King and company along the line. 
maybe a gain of about a half yard and not a whole lot more than that. Third down now coming up. That's exactly what uh, Coach Bagnoli's thinking about. He just wants to keep the ball on the ground, hopefully get a first down, get a little field position here as he lets his quarterback get a feel for the game, Tom McLeod. Al Bagnoli looking down, and his go-to back, Jim Finn, has just broken 100 yards for the day. He's going to be carrying a lot more, you would have suspected, in the fourth quarter as Penn tries to protect the lead. Now they've got a third down. Got to get it to the 45. Looks like a blitz may be coming. McLeod's throw is tipped and incomplete. Jamie Totting's got a hand on it out the play. Good job by Tottings again. Princeton's linebacker core outstanding throughout the year. Tottings at one side, on one side, Green on the other, and of course Salters in the middle. There you take a look. Tottings, little slant pattern, trying to hit that slant, which they like a lot. Princeton played it well, and Tottings was in perfect position as he gets his hands up on the ball. That's the son of a football coach right there. I know his dad, as a matter of fact. Dennis Tottings. Salvino's kick. Ludwig says, I'm not even going after it. But remember, that's what Chris Flynn did in 1985, too. Now down to the 20-yard line, it is down, and that's where Princeton's going to start it out with 1-12 now, remaining here in the third quarter. Interesting, Pani kicked the ball a little bit short, did not give Ludwig, who's an excellent punt returner, a chance to come up and field it, and got the bounce, so Princeton's looking at 80 yards. Well, Salvino's not exactly happy with the way the ball came off his foot, but he did get a good bounce out of it, and ultimately the field position is all that counts. Good-sized crowd looking on here on homecoming Saturday. Good size because it's not necessarily the nicest day to sit outside, kind of raw. But it looks a lot better when you're up 11 late in the third. There's the pitch. Great in by Rasco. Back to the 16-yard line for a four-yard loss. You don't call his name quite often enough, but he's always there, and he's very consistent. He's had a very good year. That's Larry Rasco, the defensive left tackle, number 92. Plays right off the block of the offensive tackle, Lamberton of Princeton, and just wrestles the tailback down. Second down now from the 16-yard line as time winds down here in the third quarter. Two receivers set up, and now the man in motion for Jackie Burnham. Off play action, stepping up, all kinds of time, down the sideline for Clippers. No! And we're going to get a pass interference call on Zinser, who banged up with Clippert at around the 43-yard line as Clipper was running a straight fly. It was a defensive lineman on a running back on that fly pattern. And that coverage, the one guy that has to pick up, he's like an outside linebacker in this call, this passing situation. Ooh, what was that? A stuffed tiger just got thrown out of the <laughs> upper deck. We heard it, too. Anyway, they, they made the call on Zinzer, who was trying to cover the, the fullback down the sideline. There it is right there. Close call. Here comes 38 out of the backfield. He looks back, and then he breaks out and up. Burnham puts the ball up for him. Zinzer gets the call for putting his hands on him. It must have happened just before that. A couple of things have happened here. First, we've got a tiger that apparently is not doing too well. That Tiger could probably use a little trip over to the hospital to get stitched up. We also have, if you're looking for Mitch Marrow defensively, he has now switched back to his old number 65. The official made him take off the ripped jersey. And also a first down for Princeton. Marrow in pursuit of Burnham. And Mitch Marrow got there. Good thing I told you what number he was wearing like you wouldn't have known that was Mitch Marrow. Burnham set by number 65. That is what's so impressive. That is so impressive of a 6'5", 280-pound defensive lineman to be able to come up, break laterally, go down the line of scrimmage, and catch you for a loss. And, and that guy is really at a loss. Well, apparently, right now, things looking a little tough for the Princeton Tigers as we come to the end of the third quarter. Will he be left behind? Well, a good question. 17 to 6, our score at the end of three quarters of play. The toast comes raining down, and we come back with a fourth quarter right after this.
It's amazing what some guys go through just to get an authentic NFL jersey. They should just watch the NFL team shop on QVC. Authentic NFL merchandise delivered right to your door. Pretty painless, really. But some guys never learn. The best cable channels can only be found in RCN's Family Value Package. RCN's Family Value Package is the complete cable package. Call 1-800-321-0544. Seventeen six, our score as we hit the fourth quarter of play. The lights definitely taking precedent as it gets a little bit darker. Fortunately, we have not seen much in the way of rain, and fortunately for that guy, Jackie Burnham, his team has managed to keep him pretty well protected since he came on in relief in this one. Second down for Princeton at their own twenty-yard line, and there's a look at the toast that came raining down. There was no rain, but. There was a 100% chance of toasted bread coming down out of the stands. Burnham's got a big rush coming at him again. He's running for his life. And now with a block, fumbles the football out of bounds as he got it across the 25-yard line. Here's a look at what we have seen so far today. Jeremiah Greathouse started the scoring with a 44-yard field goal. Jim Finn, a one-yard run of the second, gave had a 10-0 halftime lead. Sear kick from 33 to get Princeton within seven. But then Raider a five-yard run. Sear has hit a second, 17-6, but both starting quarterbacks are out. Now, apparently, toast is not the only thing they throw here. Some charred toast, a pretzel here or there, maybe a bagel. Burnham firing, ball tipped, ball picked. Parsons comes down with the interception inside the 40-yard line. Big interception, big play, lots of pressure on the quarterback. Burnham forces him to throw here under pressure. He tries to deliver the ball downfield. He had his fullback, Clifford, down there. Watch this as he delivers this football. He comes up, puts a lot on it. There's 15 coming back to the ball. That was uh, Canole, and the ball comes off his hands. Defenders all around him. Parsons gets the interception, Penn gets field position. So credit P.L. over getting a hand in there to tip it up into the air, and Parsons comes up to take down the interception. Good field position for the Quakers now with the Princeton 40-yard line. And Jim Finn pursued, stays on his feet, gets back to the line of scrimmage. That's a heck of a run by Jim Finn, but he may have stepped out of bounds back of the 42-yard line. Don't That's where they mark the ball. Don't try and tackle Finn up around his shoulders because you're not going to bring him down. That's what they did there. You've got to get him low. He's just too strong and overpowering. And he looks like he gets stronger as the game goes on. That's the mark of the type of running back that Al Bagnoli has run with over the years here. I mean, he is, he's down, and somehow he's still up. He did not step out right there, managed to stay in. And got something out of absolutely nothing. So now the ball at the 39 on second and nine. The cloud, quick drop. And bring in Carson there to collect the pass down at the 35-yard line. Just got a little position inside Damani Leach. And there's Mitch Merrow. He's had a series of maladies this year. He's had a concussion. He's also had mono. And now apparently we're trying to find out whether or not his left foot is okay. Well, they picked and choose and played him perfectly today when he could go and when he was in there, he was effective. Big play last time to catch Burnham for a big loss that killed the Princeton drive and eventually forced him into a throwing an interception. Big third down play and the magnitude of it is such that they decide to call for a timeout. The 35-yard line and McLeod comes over to get some instruction from Al Bagnoli with 13.53 to go here in the game. Again, Al Bagnoli playing here for field position. The wind looks like it's, well, the wind has been consistent in the direction it's coming, but it hasn't hurt the, the uh, kickers when it's going in this direction from left to right. Clean up continues, 10 by 11.
statistics show that 40 percent of all kids who smoke marijuana live in the city. Guess where the other 60 percent live? Fourth quarter action, 13.53 to go, and Penn trying to stay in the Ivy League race. Why is that? Well, Harvard already won today, and that means that they're setting up a showdown that would be coming up next week. There's the old press box on the other side of the field from where we are. Big third down play now for the Quakers, and they're going to run the football. Put it on Jim Finn's shoulders. He got the first down. Well, they knew right where they were going with that one, and Jim Finn did not disappoint, working his way over the right side for first down yardage before being stopped by Tom Silva. And they worked on the right side most of the time. The critical times, they give the ball, and he goes to the right side behind Riley, and the tight end gross this time. He picks his way, finds the opening, gets the first down. Good running here, good blocking downfield. There's Riley blocking on number 51, Walling, giving him a chance to make the cut. So Penn gets an opportunity to push it down a little bit further and to use a little bit more clock. Play action. Nice fake by McLeod. Nobody's open. He's going to have to run it. He took a shot to the head but did get it down to the 25-yard line for a couple of yard pickup. Now shots to the head can be tough if you're a quarterback and that's exactly what Matt Rader apparently dealt with after scoring his five-yard touchdown. He appears to be done for the day after that touchdown as he's sitting on the bench and they don't expect him to come back in. At the same time, they're taping up the big tackle, Mitch Morrow, and it looks to me like he will be back in. That shot wasn't as much to the head as I thought, more onto the shoulder pad, delivered by middle linebacker Jim Salters. On second down, Finn again, pounding his way on the left side, and he does not go down easily. You got to give credit to the Penn offensive line. They've come alive in the second half, and they're just warding off people, getting up on the defenders and giving the back a chance to run up behind them. Very effective that time on the left side. Cooney, LeBron, the offensive uh, left guard and left tackle. The word on Mitch Marrow down on the sidelines, as you see Al Bagnoli down on the sidelines, is that Marrow has a hyper-extended left big toe, but they have already taped him up, and I'll tell you what, I got a feeling he's going to want to come back in. We'll see whether or not he can. Adam Cota setting things up. And there's Green. Taking a look from the middle. Apparently Tom McLeod didn't like what he saw from Green or somebody else as he called for the timeout. Now Bagnoli is not happy about that timeout. They've already used two timeouts with uh, 12 minutes remaining in the fourth quarter. But that's what happens when, th when you have to come with that other quarterback. An 11-point lead for the Quakers with an even 12 minutes to go. Mitch Marrow stalking the sidelines. He wants to come back, but first, we'll see what Penn does on this drive. Every few years, a family show comes along that captures America's art. Add Comedy Central's new show, South Park, to that list. <laughs> It'll make you laugh. Laugh all you want. I'm the one who's going to be on TV looking all buff. It'll make you cry. Do your impersonation of David Caruso's career! It'll make you puke. <laughs> Kids say the darndest things. Watch South Park, only at Comedy Central. This telecast of Princeton University football is sponsored in part by McCaffrey's Supermarkets. McCaffrey's does catering. For the best the season has to offer, whatever the occasion, McCaffrey's has the answer tailgate parties, casual events, or formal affairs. You can count on McCaffrey's to make it easier on you. McCaffrey's, a supermarket experience in Princeton, West Windsor, and Yardley, Pennsylvania. 
Pat is looking at a big third down play now, leading by 11 here with 12 minutes left in the game. And Tom McLeod, the backup quarterback, the senior from Kettering, Ohio, leads him out now. They've got to get it down to the 17-yard line for the first. Looking at a three-wide receiver set. Good protection. Now it's breaking down. McLeod's throw incomplete. He threw into a crowd and over the top of a crowd. Had a variety of players there, and Penn's going to be thinking field goal now to try to go back up 14. Good pressure that time by uh, David Ferrara, number 95, coming right up the middle, right in the face. As you watch the linebacker, Timmy Green, looking up to pick up on his coverages here, he's usually the linebacker's looking for crossing receivers or dropping into the middle. They extend themselves, and now we get the field goal attempt by the great one. Jeremiah Greathouse, who got engaged on this field two weeks ago, right before the start of the game against Brown, looking at a 38-yarder, and he missed it. In golf, the way you would look at that was that you push the ball. And he was looking for a little bit of a draw, and it didn't. That happens in my golf game a lot. So that leaves the window open for Princeton now, down by 11 points. The question is, is their offensive unit going to be able to get enough done? And order to try to get back into it and give Steve Tosh's team a shot to come back and play for the tie. College football has obviously changed with the advent of the two-point conversion. And that means that 11 is still a doable number with a touchdown and a field goal. Jackie Burnham leading his team out. They were going to run a quarterback draw, but there was a flag thrown on the play before Puzio. he even started. I think Puzio might have jumped in the middle or somebody in the middle jumped for Penn. Made contact. Offsides is the call. 54 Puzio, the nose guard, just moves a little too quick. Went on voice rather than movement of the football, and they got him. So the Princeton first down makes it first and five for their own 27. Burnham has been on since the beginning of the second half. Harry Nakelney, the starting quarterback, left at halftime. That's Clifford getting up out of the stance and moving. And on play action, Burnham. Throwing deep down the field, got a man, complete. Bishop will go around. Bishop makes a dive and comes up with a touchdown saving catch. Caught the receiver from behind, but Ryan Crowley flying in on the post pattern from the left side has given Princeton life at the Pennsylvania 13 yard line. Ryan Crowley came into this game with 15 receptions and two touchdowns with those 15 receptions. He shows quickness here, the bottom of the screen. He comes down, he runs a post pattern and a beautifully thrown pass by Burnham. He catches it without even breaking stride and a great effort by John Bishop saves a touchdown. Here we see it from ground level. Great delivery by Burnham, right on the money. Big play for Princeton to get themselves back into this football game. They're in close inside the 15-yard line. Burnham took a heck of a shot as he got rid of that ball and still delivered it right on the money. There's a look at Crowley. The gift to Gerardo. Not a lot there. He gets pancaked over his own man. No gain on the play. It'll stay at the 13 for second down. When you get in here now against this defense, you got to run into that seam and get the hole. That time, Gerardo sort of stammered a little bit, waiting to find an opening. There's not going to be many openings. you got to get up and get what you can here. Tough to run against a defense that closes so well. And you mentioned they've been tough defensively in recent weeks as far as giving up scores, touchdowns in particular. It's something that they've taken a lot of pride in in recent weeks. We'll see what Princeton can put together now. They've got to get a score here. It should be a touchdown. Burnham trying to sprint out. Marrow's in the way. Now back the other way. Nobody's home. Burnham in a foot race for the end zone of the touchdown. Jackie Burnham goes 13 yards, and suddenly Princeton is within five. The crowd that made the 41-mile drive down here to Franklin Field finally got an opportunity to celebrate the end zone, and now they've got to go for the two-point conversion. That was a great individual effort. He came out on the pass, set up, nothing was open. Penn over-pursued, trying to chase him down to the left side. He just saw the opening and took off, and he has showed ourselves some great speed in getting into the end zone. Big play by this kid. He's played extremely well since he came into the football game. Big moment in the football game. They've got to hit the two-point to be within three. Burnham's rolling. 
Burnham throwing, and it's good. Got Girado all by himself with a two-point conversion. Just moments ago, it looked as if Princeton were going to give up a score that would put him out of the game for good, but we've told you about this rivalry, and we've told you about the games between these teams. It's now a three-point game with 10.33 to go. Came up with three receivers to the right side here. Penn looks like they're a little bit confused. The, the outside receiver just breaks to the outside. And nobody's open. That's the old pick play in the end zone. As you see it from ground level, Burnham comes out here, a little half sprint, and delivers the ball into the sideline. The receiver is wide open, Gerardo, the tailback, who was flanked out there in a trips formation. Most of that drive can be attributed to Jackie Burnham, who threw a big pass, a perfect pass, with pressure coming at him to Ryan Crowley, and then this play. Here it is now. Here's the sprint out to the left. Nobody's open. He sees the opening to the right side. Penn is over-pursued, and he's got enough speed and enough determination to find that end zone. Can't do it any better. Five carries, 16 yards, and that was the biggest one of the day for him, the 13-yard touchdown. Steve Tosh's team back to within three points. Anybody's game now with 10.33 to go as Penn's going to field the kickoff. That's Rossingo juggling it. Following a lead block. Flagged out of the play. This one's going to come back as Rossingo got it out to the 35-yard line. They're going to sort this out, and we'll take one more look at a quarterback deciding to change direction mid-play. Here he is. He's going to sprint out to the left side, try to pull up after a little play fake to his tailback to find somebody to throw to. He sees all those blue jerseys, and he decides, hey, maybe I can get a first down. Right about now, he realizes he can make the end zone, and he's going to do it. Big play by Jackie Burnham. The fact that Mitch Merrow was there to pursue actually ended up hurting Penn there because once he didn't get him, there was nobody home behind him. Holding was the call on the return against the Quakers, and it's going to drop him back to the 21. We'll see now what happens with Al Bagnoli and what he decides to do. He's got his backup quarterback, McLeod, in the game. And, of course, Finn has had an outstanding day running the football. He may try to get himself out of the hole here by running the football. Jim Finn banging over the left side for a gain of five down to the 26-yard line. And let's take it out of the field right now and check in once again with Jason Barr. All right, quickly, Scott, just want to let you know that Matt Rader, the Penn quarterback, has gone to the locker room. So it looks like it's Tom McLeod against Jackie Burnham from here on in. Back upstairs. Well, so far, Princeton's probably gotten the better of that as Burnham really showed well on that last drive, throwing a key big pass on a post pattern and also showing his running ability getting into the end zone. Now McLeod's turn to answer, second down. Got Finn back there, but Finn lost his footing, and Jamie Tottings was there to finish the hit. Back of the 23-yard line. Sticking on the ground, and that's smart to do here. One, because of the field position he's in, and also because he's given the football to the best back on the field so far this today, and that is Jim Finn. This time he trips up, as you said right there, and he never got a chance to get his momentum. Tottings was waiting right there to help contain the run, so it would have been tough anyway. Now a third down. And if Princeton holds here, they have absolutely got all the momentum with 9.15 to go. Play action. The crowd's got a little time. And the throw is incomplete. Gross couldn't hang on out of the 32-yard line. Fox stops with 9.04 to go, and Penn's got to punt it away after a three and out. How the momentum can change, little things that happen. That time, the quarterback here fake it. That's the boot action. He comes away from Finn. He wants to get himself squared. He's looking for his tight end, Gross, coming across. He sees him. He delivers it a little bit low, and he can't come up with it. Now Bagnoli watching his team see the momentum squared away, and now Salvino is going to be kicking it away to Ludwig. Gets the kick off. Pretty good one. Ludwig. He's 38. Got a hole up the sideline. And in the Penn territory, shoved out of bounds at the 43-yard line. Tom Ludwig is an outstanding athlete. Comes out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's a senior now. He's played ever since his sophomore's freshman year, actually. He's got great speed, and he's come back this year probably with the best season he's had since his first year of varsity competition. Comes into this game with four interceptions, 45 tackles. They moved him to the strong safety position, and they use him as the all-purpose punt returner also. 
Obviously a happy guy. He's put his team in good field position. They start in Penn territory. And the gift to Gerardo, who gets stood up at the line of scrimmage by Darren McDonald, who kept up to fill the hole. Maybe a gain of about a yard down to the 41. McDonald just stood up in there and made the play. 34 solo tackles coming into this football game. Number 44, Darren McDonald. All the momentum prints his way, and they probably get about another 12 to 13 yards away, and they are within range for their field goal kicker, Alex Sir. Burnham's got to get his team to the line quickly. Just two on the play clock, and he does. Off play action now. Throwing complete. Canole's got it down at the 25-yard line. That's a dig pattern, an in pattern by the wide receiver coming from the left to the right. Gets a little bit beyond the linebackers in front of the defender. Big catch by Cano. Great delivery to a spot. He threw to a spot by the quarterback, Burnham. Couldn't have thrown that ball any better. Inside Robertson and in front of Bishop. First down, poor play action. Burnham still rolling and throwing incomplete. Piello made a nice play getting in front of Bill Wendler. Good pursuit, too, by Penn defensively. They forced Burnham to the sideline, and he had to throw that ball across his body as he was running to the sideline. So many Penn Princeton games have come down to the fourth quarter. And this one has the exact same look as four years ago when Penn was winning by a 30 to 14 score and Terrence Stokes was setting a Penn record. Same mist, same lights, same temperature. Kind of like deja vu all over again, except this time it's tight. That's Clifford moving. And Gerardo with some blocking. Ran the wrong way behind his blockers. And Gage was there to make the stop. You called it. He should have stayed right up behind Clifford and gotten a little yardage. Instead, he's looking to pick a hole. He doesn't have that kind of quickness. So that sets up a big third down play. Crowd standing. Defensively, Penn's got to come up with a stick here. And Princeton's got to be thinking about the field goal range because they're in it right now for a rather long attempt. Any loss or a sack might take them out of it. Plenty of time left with 7.15 to go as Burnham works out of the shotgun. Gets around Marrow. Now throwing incomplete. So it is going to be Sirk's attempt now to try to tie this game up. He's going to have about a 43-yarder, Bob. What a great effort by Marrow and great pressure. Burnham never really had a chance to make the delivery, and 49 comes up also there to put a little pressure. But look at the effort by Marrow. After he gets around him, he comes inside out to make a play on him. 7.02 left to go, and Sirk, who has not missed a field goal this year, remember that point, now working for 43, the wind a little bit in his face and coming from his right to his left. There's the kick. Plenty of distance. And we're all tied up at 17 with 6.57 to go. What a turnaround in the second half. Princeton has had several, several opportunities. And they've cashed in enough to come to tie this football game. Penn had really one big drive running behind Jim Finn and finally the touchdown by Raider. But otherwise, Princeton has controlled the game offensively in the second half. And they've gotten back into the game as we watch this phenomenal place kicker for Princeton, Alex Sir. A junior out of Bettendorf, Iowa. Billed in the media notes as the guy in America who has not missed a kick this year. Full minimum. So now, 6.57 to go, and if you're Penn, it's looking a little dicey. You've got a quarterback you're not quite sure about in McLeod, I wonder whether or not they think about going another way. And we're starting to get a little bit more rain here. Warming up on the sideline for the Quakers is Jason Batting. I wonder whether or not he might end up seeing action. Right now, he's the backup because, as we told you, Penn has lost their starter. Finn, taken down. All the momentum Princeton's way right now. The special teams play made by Jim Salters, and Penn's going to start out inside their 20. Thank you. 
now with the rain coming down a little bit, it's a little bit slick. Everything has to break your way. You've got to be very careful of what you do here. Penn never really having great field position all second half. Again, lines up inside their 20-yard line. Nice play by Salters to get the leg out on Finn before he could turn the corner. Now it's up to McLeod. First and 10, Penn at their own 19. Quick drop. And the throw is behind him and incomplete. Leach knocking it away from Doug O'Neill. Probably would not have been complete anyway as McLeod's throw just on the timing was a little bit behind his receiver. Leach can afford to play and play up a little tighter now. Penn went to that earlier in the game with Raider. Went to that little slant pattern on first down to try and pick up five or six yards. This time, Leach is right there to defend against it. Knocked away by Leach. Two-time All-Ivy player the last couple of seasons. McLeod is now just one for four throwing the football. Going back to Finn on his 28th carry of the day. He's not going to get much. Maybe a gain of a yard, yard and a half just across the 20. And third down in a throwing situation coming up for Penn as the clock continues to move and Al Bagnoli tries to come up with a way for his team to score. Before all they had to do was kill the clock, but now we're tied up. And don't forget there is overtime in college football now if we were indeed to end in a tie. Princeton brings uh, Brett Marshall into the game as the fifth defensive back to Nickelback as they expect the pass play right here. They're on number two quarterback, Todd Loud. Billed in the media notes is the guy in America who has not missed a kick this year with a five field goal minimum. So now, 6.57 to go, and if you're Penn, it's looking a little dicey. You've got a quarterback you're not quite sure about in McLeod. I wonder whether or not they think about going another way. And we're starting to get a little bit more rain here. Warming up on the sideline for the Quakers is Jason Batting. I wonder whether or not he might end up seeing action. Right now, he's the backup because, as we told you, Penn has lost their starter. Finn. Taken down, all the momentum Princeton's way right now. The special teams play made by Jim Salters, and Penn's going to start out inside their 20. Now with the rain coming down a little bit, it's a little bit slick. Everything has to break your way. You got to be very careful of what you do here. Penn never really having great field position all second half. Again, lines up inside their 20-yard line. Nice play by Salters to get the leg out on Finn before he could turn the corner. Now it's up to McLeod. First and 10, Penn at their own 19. Quick drop. And the throw is behind him and incomplete. Leach knocking it away from Doug O'Neill. Probably would not have been complete anyway as McLeod's throw just on the timing was a little bit behind his receiver. Leach can afford to play and play up a little tighter now. Penn went to that earlier in the game with Raider. Went to that little slant pattern on first down to try and pick up five or six yards. This time, Leach is right there to defend against it. Knocked away by Leach. Two-time All-Ivy player the last couple of seasons. Cloud is now just one for four throwing the football. Going back to Finn on his 28th carry of the day. He's not going to get much. Maybe a gain of a yard, yard and a half just across the 20. And third down in a throwing situation coming up for Penn as the clock continues to move and Al Bagnoli tries to come up with a way for his team to score. Before all they had to do was kill the clock, but now we're tied up and don't forget there is overtime in college football now if we were indeed to end in a tie. Princeton brings uh, Brett Marshall into the game as the fifth defensive back to Nickelback as they expect the pass play right here. Pressure now on number 10 quarterback Tom McLeod. Three receivers set again as Bagnoli looks on. The play is sent in. Big rush coming. The cloud throws. Not going to be Aaron incomplete. Five play by the Princeton defense, and they own it all momentum-wise now. Griff King Watch dropping this. back into coverage. There's the play, and it goes off the helmet of number 94, Gift King, the defensive end, who's dropping back in that particular coverage to add an extra defender. Salvino back to kick it away. He'll let it go from just outside his 10. And Ludwig, a dangerous return man, 
is at the Princeton 45. They're going to have good field position. Salvino's kick won't quite turn over. Ludwig lets it bounce. It takes a Princeton bounce. And then a pen bounce again as it's going to roll dead at the pen 49-yard line. So Princeton is probably only about 18 or 19 yards away from field goal range with 5.40 to go. Upcoming games for these two teams, well, Princeton still has a couple of them left. The Road Warrior season is coming to an end. They'll be taking on Yale next week at Giants Stadium. We'll be there. And then at Dartmouth to end the season. Looking to win. Last couple come out with a winning record. First and 10 Tigers at the Quaker 49-yard line with 5.40 to go. Gelato. A little bit of room. McDonald hanging on for dear life. Got some help from Fiela after a gain of about a yard. Now Penn absolutely needs a win here in order to set up a showdown next weekend in Cambridge. Harvard already won today. Harvard on top by a game in the standings undefeated in the Ivy League. And then Penn will be back here and we'll be here for that one against Cornell to close out the season. But for that last game to mean anything, they need to win here, and they've got to go up and get a win in Cambridge. Block counting with 5.02 to go. Burnham chased out of the pocket. Lots of room to operate now. Down the sideline. First down yardage. Burnham dances out of bounds down at the Penn 38-yard line with a Princeton first down. Well, it looked like a halfback on that play. It has a flag down on the field way back, and I think this is going to go against Princeton. Burnham dancing down the sideline. Watch this as a halfback. He just tips out and gets to the first down sticks and makes it, but it's all in vain as we see a flag sitting right on the yard line at the 49. Dennis Hennigan, the referee, talking it over. And it is going to bring it all back due to a holding call. Or is that an illegal block? I would think it's a holding call because he got on the corner running the football. Probably somebody grabbed one of those defensive linemen. But there's the play. There's the block. It's an illegal block. Yeah. Good job by the guys in the truck. And out Tashis trying to get a message to his backup quarterback who's come on and performed well. He's led his team back to a tie in the last five minutes of the fourth quarter. Trying to continue it the run and Hiskin knocks him out of bounds shy of midfield at the Princeton 48 yard line stopping the clock with 446 to go great effort by Hiskin the linebacker who comes off that block and has enough on it to get him out of bounds he was looking to get up the sideline again but the linebacker was there big play by the linebacker for Penn here you see it now he starts down he realizes he's got coverage here downfield here's Hiskin setting up one-on-one -on -one with him. There comes the blocker, and he goes through that blocker to make the tackle. Huge third down play. You see, Princeton has gotten it done here in the second half. Got to get it to the pin 39 for the first down. Burnham firing. Complete for the first down. Inside the 35-yard line, and still on his feet is Phil Wendler. Looked like Mark Bavaro in 86 at the former Candlestick Park. Princeton still alive and right on the doorstep of field goal range with four and a half minutes to go. Wendler's made some key catches today. He comes across again, across the middle, makes the catch on the run. The ball is right there for him. He knows where the first down marker is, and he gets the first down. Came into this game with 10 receptions. He's had a few key ones today. Now the Tigers want to work a little clock and get just a little bit closer for their reliable field goal kicker. Gerardo to the middle. Snowed under by the Penn defenders just inside the 30-yard line. Got to be a second down coming up. Courting a whole lot of that football right now. Penn defensively flying to the football. Gerardo picks up a couple of yards. Want to keep it right in the middle of the field. That's what they're thinking. Time winding down under four minutes to go. And it's amazing, isn't it, Bob? We talked at the time about Matt Rader going down and whether or not that would be a big injury. It turned into a game-turning injury. Absolutely, and off came this guy, Jackie Burnham, out of nowhere. With the second down. Playing conservatively, Burnham tackled by Merrill and company. 
after no game. Very conservatively that time, looking at a little option action. That time he decided to keep the ball and go back against the flow, but Penn pursued perfectly. Another interesting point as you take a look at Burnham here, playing conservatively, kind of play dried up on him, and Mitch Merrill had a hold of him. Remember earlier in the half when Al Bagnoli was upset about McLeod taking two timeouts? Well, Penn only has one left. They can't stop the clock right now. They're going to need that timeout. Absolutely. Very good point. That's why coaches try to preserve those timeouts as much as they can. Could be the play of the game right here on third down for the 29. Burnham's looking right. He's hit as he throws, and it's incomplete. So now they're going to put it on the shoulders of Alex Sirk, who's going to try from 46 yards away to give Princeton the lead with under three minutes to go. They bring it back to where the ball started on that third down play is in the middle of the field. So Sirk, who's been incredibly consistent, unbelievable, has the ball at least in the middle of the field. Distance is the key here. Market at the 36-yard line from dead on. Cirque, who has not missed this year, gunning for 46. There you see the numbers today. Snap is good. Kick is blocked. It's blocked and it's rolling free. Fiella try to get on top of it. The Quakers still try to recover, and they come up huge with a blocked field goal attempt. In the last three minutes of the game, Penn gets the football back. Unbelievable. What a big play. John Bishop falling on top of the ball. First glance, Bob, I didn't see who got it coming by. It looked like Beckwith who was coming in from the side. We'll catch it on the replay, but a huge play. The guy who hadn't missed all year had it in his gun sights. Here it and is. We see it from big. ground level. Number 22. It looked to me knifed in there. May have been. Bishop was the guy who also rolled on top of the ball, and now Penn has it in Princeton territory. They need about 18 yards now. McLeod giving it off to Finn. Finn, breaking tackles, gets it down to the 40-yard line. Plenty of time, plenty of time for this quarterback not to rush the situation, Tom McLeod. One timeout remains for Penn. Gradually getting more and more gloomy here with rain falling. It's getting darker, 2.12 to go. Once again, it's Finn. Keeping it him. Here's the post of speed. To the outside, he's got first down yardage and knocked out of bounds at the Princeton 27-yard line. Pat is likely moved into field goal range now with 1.58 left in the game. Hard to believe it, but there's the guy to give the ball to as we watch Greathouse warming up on the sideline. He wants another shot at it, surely, after missing one earlier. What an incredible turn of events. Penn was leading this one by a 17-6 score. Princeton comes back. They're setting up for a possible game-winning field goal. Penn blocks it, and now Penn's driving. Finn with 139 yards on the ground today. They're going to stay right with Finn. Counter play, and he bangs his way inside the 25-yard line, down near the 23. Block continues to run. He just wants that football, and he's proven it. He's taken that football from up around the 45-yard line in three carries now. The other thing they're doing is they're taking that clock down with them, so that's very important for him. They're relying on Jim Finn to get them as close as they can get. And he's carrying him on his shoulders right now. On second down. Finn again. Banging away off a tackle. And getting down to about the 22-yard line as the clock winds down to 112 left. Again, give credit to that offensive line. They've come, the, come up for the occasion right now. That right side, Konish and Riley have blocked consistently all day. And Finn has been able to run through those seams and break it to the outside when he has to. Under a minute to play, a third down play. They'd love to get a little closer for Greathouse if they can. Remember, Penn has one timeout left. Finn. Banging ahead. 
he got down close, but not quite close enough. Just inside the 17-yard line. This is where he had to be. He got it down to about the 18, so he's a yard and a half short. They're going to count it down and take one shot at it. That's exactly what they're going to do. And there he is. There's the difference right there, number seven. Finn saying, come on, you got to do something here. And they call for the timeout with eight seconds left in the game, and it all falls down now to the kicker. Quick timeout. We'll be back with the field goal attempt in a moment. Well, it wasn't that long ago that Penn looked like it had the game in its back pocket at 17 to 6. But then Jackie Burnham, the backup quarterback, heroically led Princeton down the field. A touchdown, a two-point conversion, and a field goal tied the game. And then a possible game-winning field goal got blocked as Penn came up big. Now they're going to try to win it themselves as Jeremiah Greathouse is going to attempt this one from 35 yards away right after the Princeton timeout. It's an attempt to ice him with eight seconds to go. What a game. Great game. Great comeback in the second half by Princeton. But again, give credit where credit is due in this last drive. Besides blocking the field goal try, they've given the ball to Jim Finn, and Jim Finn has done it all. He's got them in this position right here. Well, as we said, and as we documented for you at halftime, this is not the first time it's ever come down to the last play. These two teams have played some brilliant games, some unpredictable and exciting games, and this one's going to go right there in among the Penn Princeton history books. Steve Toshis, not much he can do right now except to hope that his special teams comes up big and returns the favor. And the entire game has now come down to that guy, the recently engaged Jeremiah Greathouse, the senior from Gator Country in Gainesville, Florida. And Princeton is going to use another timeout. At this point, if you're Steve Toshis, why not? It's a good move. It's a good move. The difference here may be, though, that you're trying to ice a senior kicker, and Greathouse has been in these situations before. He's got the experience, he's got the position, he's just got to get everything put together in the right snap and get the ball down. Although if I were Al Bagnoli, I don't know that I would like my kicker coming over for one more quick attempt in the middle of the timeout. Jeremiah, he's saying, don't leave this kick on the sidelines. That meant something, but I'm not sure what. I think just letting this thing just grow. You see Steve Tosh, it's, it's out of his control now. Two minutes ago, he felt he had a shot at it all. He had the best place kicker in the country, the most consistent place kicker, lined up to win the game for him, actually. Great field position, and now it comes back to this. There it is. Rain is falling. Watch the snap. Watch the hole. Great house from 35 with eight seconds to go, ostensibly for the win. The kick is up. The kick is good. Four seconds left, and Penn is on top, 20 to 17. <laughs> Jeremiah Greathouse steps up and drills it. And two studies in how a game can turn in the matter of two minutes. The emotions that run in such short periods of time. Well, he came through. He got his chance, and there's Al Bagnoli looking at it and saying, wow. Boy, what a relief. Steve Tosh is saying, no, 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 go wide, go wide. But it wasn't to be. So now four seconds left in the game. The obvious squid kick as Greathouse gets congratulated by his teammates. No greater feeling for a kicker and they step up and possibly win the game. Well, he's done that a lot in his career. He's had a brilliant career in his own right. 
What a super football game. Back and forth, back and forth. Well, it, it's exactly what you talked about all afternoon. The rivalry speaks for itself, and it played out just that way. Tough for Princeton. They came in with a lot of feeling for this season. They felt they had a shot after winning four in a row, but the last three weekends have been really difficult for them. On the other side, Penn, now, as we said earlier, they control their own destiny. A lot of pressure on that guy now. As Gerardo is back deep, along with Grant, they are both standing along their own five-yard line. The kick is probably going to be squibbed, so the receiver can't get a lot of momentum going with four seconds left. And there's the squib kick. And dropping straight down to the ground with three seconds to go. Princeton will have one final shot at it. Well, we know what they're going to do. They're going to line up in trips. They're going to just throw that Hail Mary down deep. Hope somebody either catches the ball or we have a penalty. Penn is doing everything it can to make sure that there will be no miracles here. And Jim Finn is back on the field. Finn is back on the field on the defensive side for the first time today. Standing at his own 30-yard line just to make sure. Penn has four players that are 30 yards plus off the ball. Burnham with one more shot at it on the last play of the game. Big pursuit coming. He's in a lot of trouble. And he's set to end it. Piskin got him with the sack back of the 21-yard line. And yes, Virginia, there still is an Ivy League football race in 1997. Penn stays alive with a thrilling victory in the closing seconds against Princeton by a 20-17 final score.